Okay, good morning, good afternoon, or good day to uh, good early evening to all of you uh, who are here at the second day of Expert uh, Venus Management, virtual and interactive. For those of you who were here yesterday, you kind of know what we're doing. This is a, a program, there's no formal lectures, all difficult, unusual case presentations with a lot of back and forth discussion from uh, panelists, but also those of you attendees in the audience, uh, if you look on the bottom of your screen, you can either submit questions or you can raise your hand. And when you do that, uh, our technical people from Radcliffe Vascular will allow you to, to speak and ask your question. So we want you not to just sit there and listen. We'd like you even in the middle of somebody talking, if you have a question, raise your hand or submit a question and we'll, uh, we'll pose it to them or you'll pose it yourself. Uh, also, uh, this meeting is really the first one. We did three hours yesterday. We're doing three hours again today. Um, we hope you find it interesting and, uh, and interactive, which is what we want. Our technical support and the entire support for the uh, meeting has been with Radcliffe Vascular, uh, who has been helping us throughout this and, and other uh, different types of uh, meetings and uh, podcasts. So we want to thank them. They're doing a fantastic uh, job. Also industry supporters. Yesterday you heard from industry. Today you're gonna to hear from industry uh, about their uh, various products because clearly you're not gonna be able to walk around their, their booths. So um, they're gonna bring you some information. Uh, so let's we'll start out. Um, Mike, you wanna do your, your Radcliffe thing first? I'm Steve Elias. The other uh, co-directors are uh, Tony Gasparis and Nikos Labropoulos. And we'll introduce everybody else as they come on during the meeting. Okay, so once again, we want to thank Radcliffe Vascular. They've been, been supporting this, this entire meeting, headed by uh, David Ramsey and, and Liam O'Neill. So thank you guys, and we'll thank you during the, the course of this meeting again. Uh, also, industry. This meeting is being brought to you. None of you had to pay to attend this meeting. That's the way we wanted it to be, and that's the way industry wanted it to be. So they're the ones that have been supporting this. We're going to hear now from uh, Penumbra and Carson Miller, who is their uh, senior marketing manager, a little bit about the uh, Penumbra product. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, so I, my name is Carson Milner. I work on the Indigo system for Penumbra. Um, since the launch of the Indigo system with Cat3 and Cat5 and these early generation pumps, Penumbra has continued to innovate um, our thrombus removal technology and grow our impact on patients suffering from thrombus in the body. Um, most recently, we added uh, the treatment of pulmonary embolism indication uh, and currently we have some exciting products that have been cleared by the FDA and hopefully we can uh, launch these to you all and get them in your hands in the next couple of months. First is the um, Aspiration Catheter 12, the Cat 12. 
And the second is our next generation aspiration tubing, the lightning aspiration tubing. Um, and we believe that both of these products will further progress our impact on patients suffering from thrombus in the body. Uh, and we're excited in the next couple of months to have you all um, try them out. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Carson. And we uh, wanna thank uh, Penumbra for their support of this uh, meeting as well. So we're going to our first uh, segment, which is really cases with mixed disease. And uh, for this, we brought a mix of people from the UK. Uh, first will be Jerry O'Sullivan, and then will be uh, Stephen Black. And I think you're gonna find these cases uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, challenging. We also have a panel, what we call our first row, of uh, Ellen, Dil Ellen Dillavu, Nick Sakalis, and uh, 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 Raghu Kalori as well, that can help to comment on these cases. So we'll have Jerry, so uh, thanks for joining us and thank you very much to Steve, uh, Tony and Nikos for having us. Uh, this is going to be the way of the future, I think, for quite some time to come in the COVID world. Zero thrombolysis is something that's achieving a lot of attention. We're well past a tract now. We've moved on from all of the different problems that that had. But one thing that became clear was that your discussion with patients is very different when you have... Uh, uh, got to mention thrombolysis. If you have a typical patient who comes in with an acutely swollen lower extremity, you, you prove that it's an iliofemoral DVT. If you've got to discuss it with them in the context of, we're going to give you this drug and there's a remote risk of stroke, it's a very different discussion to, we're going to put in basically some sort of vacuum cleaner and clean up the thrombus. So for me, I'm moving more and more towards techniques which use as little uh, or no thrombolysis as possible. And this is a typical case which we're going to show you. Um, the, uh, this patient was an inpatient uh, on the wards. She'd had a complicated recent medical history with um, gallstones and ascending cholangitis. And this case was from November 2019, so pre-COVID. Um, had a, a swollen leg, a diagnosed with a DVT. Her ultrasound showed the popliteal vein is open. For me, that's an important first step. In Galway, then we do a CT pulmonary angiogram followed by a CT venogram, and you might say that's overkill. But the purpose of that is that I don't want to get caught out with a big pulmonary embolus. Specifically, I don't want to get caught out with right ventricular strain. So um, she had neither of those. She had a significant pulmonary embolus. Her RVLV ratio was satisfactory. Um, and there, her CTV showed quite extensive deep vein thrombosis. And this is moving through quite quickly. You can see this thrombus here in the common femoral, common iliac, very swollen or extremity. Um, and then images here show the May-Turner lesion and thrombus in the common and external iliac compared to the other side. So um, this would be a fairly standard DVT. Um, patient is prone, popliteal access, ultrasound guidance, micropuncture system, ascending venography, gentle ascending venography. You're injecting three to five cc's. You're not taking a blast of contrast and trying to whack it in. I once saw a memorable case many, many years ago in California where that had a very deleterious outcome, which probably isn't suitable for broadcasting. Um, this is what uh, intravascular ultrasound looked like beforehand, and you can see that there's um, high echogenicity. For those of you who aren't familiar with IVUS, that would be me. Uh, the arteries on the right of your screen, it's the smaller, rounder thing. The vein is uh, bigger and it's sort of gray. Um, the, ideally, the vein should be about the same size as the artery, but it should be black around the catheter. Um, so this is an over-the-wire device. It's an, uh, an 018 uh, 10 French sheath. Uh, it's got a basket here, and the basket can change size in response to the vessel. Uh, this is called VTEX. This is only my second time using the product, so I put in a filter first. We use a, a popliteal approach uh, and put in an ALN filter. You then advance the device um, as far as the uh, the area uh, in question, in this case, there's a May Turner. So I, I typically do not go beyond the May Turner lesion when I'm uh, performing the thrombectomy. Um, and the, sorry, the uh, after thrombectomy, your first pass, and we've got reasonable clearance, but not perfect by any manner of means. Um, and second pass of device, same sort of deal. You can appreciate perhaps on your right hand screen that the a device changes diameter as it enters narrow segments. That's quite useful. It's not like pulling 
a big basket down through a lesion or through a, a potential lesion, it changes in diameter in response to the vessel. Here it's quite narrow, and so the basket changes in size. Um, this is a venog oops, pardon me, I'm jump, jumping ahead of myself, my apologies. Uh, venography after uh, the second pass, and we've got, um, now we're starting to, the rubber's starting to hit the road. We're, we're getting thrombus clearance. The thing I like about this device, you're getting wall to wall. Um, and you can see that, as is typical in these cases, um, you get a standing column of contrast extending up as far as, as the area of stenosis. So often when people come to visit, you know, they say, are you sure you need a stent? And honestly, I would say to them, sorry, come back a step. We've got pretty much clear thrombus uh, or clear of thrombus by this time. So that's really exciting because this is zero TPA, so very nice from that aspect. Um, but we haven't dealt with the underlying stenosis. And you can see that clearly here we've got a, I think this is a barred atlas 1660 balloon, which would be my probably one of my workhorses. And you can see it's the May Turner lesion is directly online with the spinous process here. Your stent needs to start between the pedicle and the spinous process. And there's a nice paper by one of my fellows last year in um, one of the journals about that, how the landing zone, if you get the spinous process directly in between the two pedicles, not off, then you can land the stent very precisely. And I believe this was, I think, I can't actually see it, Cook Silver Vena perhaps, or Bard Venovo, I'm not sure which. Uh, it's certainly one of the dedicated venous stents yeah. and standard balloon angio angioplasty afterwards. Um, so intravascular ultrasound now we're coming from above uh, down so this is inferior vena cava um, and now we're coming into the stent and you can see the stent is a typical uh, self-expanding venous design stent will be slightly oblong at the may turner point and as you go below the stent you see that there is still some thrombus along the wall and i think this is a learning point for me certainly that you don't get although you you think you get wall to wall with any thrombectomy device in practice terms, you don't get the same degree of wall-to-wall -wall that you get after three days of catheter-directed thrombolysis, but nonetheless, obviously, your risks are a lot lower uh, in terms of bleeding and so on. And this is what your venography looks like afterwards. And you've got pretty much gangbusters flow abolition of all collaterals, rapid inline flow through the stent and up into the inferior vena cava. Uh, you can see she's got a, an IVC filter and her biliary stent in place there. This is just a close-up of the device passing through uh, an area of narrowing. It's actually not from my case. It's, it's because I tend to leave it south of it. But you can see how much it changes in diameter. And that is reassuring to me, I suppose, that I'm not damaging the wall of the vein uh, as I go through. And this was from the actual case. And you can see that there's quite a lot of dense uh, adherent um, and fairly chronic-looking thrombus. For me, acute thrombus is black or very dark and chronic, more chronic thrombus is white uh, or sort of gray. So your pros and cons, um, some people hate single sessions, some people love it. I love it because it's quick and I have the attention span of a gnat on a summer's day. Um, you're done, you know, it's slam bam, thank you ma'am, you're done in two hours, okay? So there's no ICU bed, there's no bloods, no venograms, no repeat trips back and forth to the lab and arranging all of that. My attention span is just not suitable for that. On the other hand, it does take two hours. So if you've got you know, 18 cases on your cath lab list, it's far more efficient for you to put in a catheter and walk away and bring the patient back the next day. So it swings and roundabouts and you need to find something which suits you. Um, it is much easier with a patent popliteal vein. I've learned from bitter experience, you can open it up by doing what we call crisscross. So going uh, up the leg and down the leg, quite technically difficult or else you can puncture the posterior tibial vein at the ankle. Uh, that's not as easy as it sounds. Pop the teal vein is much, much easier. Um, I would suggest you use a filter early on in your experience. Um, some of the questions that have come in, why would you do single session as opposed to catheter-directed thrombolysis, or which patients would be more suited to catheter-directed thrombolysis? Well, for me, if I've got a lot of thrombus in the inferior vena cava, I tend to use more CDT. If I've got a lot of pulmonary embolus, I would definitely tend to use more CDT. And the purpose of that is obviously your, your TPA becomes systemic and causes systemic thrombolysis, not only, only of the pulmonary embolus, but also the IVC thrombus. When I've got extensive IVC thrombus, um, I'd rather drip it for a couple of days so I can open out and see how much of a normal cava I have. Because I've been burnt in the past by trying to use a, a thrombectomy device 
And then at the end of a two hour session, you've got a kind of a dog's dinner of an IVC. You don't, you don't know whether this is a lot of thrombus or a lot of scarring or atresia or agenesis or what is it? So I prefer to use catheter directed thrombolysis there. And again, if you've got an extensive baloney thrombus as part of an iliofemoral DVT, then again, for me, CDT is a preferable option because none of the pharmacomechanical thrombectomy devices work particularly well uh, in, in the six calf ends. You know, it's just a numbers game. So once you go above the popliteal, I think a thrombectomy device is better suited. Hey, Jerry. I'll, I'll shut up there. Jerry. Yes. And, and you mentioned this, you know, with popliteal baloney, popliteal thrombus. Um, and with most of these devices, any device, if you have significant infrapopliteal disease, you do run the risk of failure if you don't have good inflow. Agreed. What percentage of times do you have patients? I mean, it depends on where you're from, right? If you're, if you're, uh, yeah, from, it's, uh, when you can do that, I, I would say it's about a quarter, actually. I, I'm over the years, I know some people love puncturing the posterior tibial vein at the angle. I find it really technically difficult. And I've learned that I need to get the best ultrasound machine in the one with the hockey stick probe, you know, little flat fella. They're quite expensive, but boy, the vein all of a sudden becomes a lot bigger and you can see it much more easily. And I'm much less likely to hit the artery and insert the six French sheath into the arteries I've done a few times. Um, so I would say it's about a quarter of the time that, that uh, I need to go below the knee. Um, most of the time it, it is, uh, the popliteal vein is open. If you have to, you can go low popliteal. So with a patient still prone, uh, you puncture the very, say, the confluence of the anterior tibial and posterior tibial, the paired veins, that's doable. Um, anything below mid-calf, you're into the muscle and you've got to put your sheath through the muscle, tends to be quite sore and it restricts their activity afterwards. So that would be my, my zeitgeist on it. Yeah, anybody on, the, anybody on the panel have thoughts about that uh, posterior tibial? I, I actually like it if the size of the, of the sheath is going to, being in maybe, you know, a seven or an eight French. I don't like to put much bigger than that. I agree. Uh, but I agree with you, no, I mean, that's... Jerry, you need good imaging. And I actually yeah. don't find it all that that uh, difficult with the, with the good imaging. Um, yeah, I agree. And as long as you don't have a bad tremor, you know, th things, are, things, are, things are fine. Right. <laughs> and apropos to your sticking something into the uh, posterior tibial artery, I mean, I know you're very, very good. You're being very uh, humble. But if anyone's going to stick veins that they're not 1,000% sure they're in a vein, you know, a little four French micropuncture sheath with a little dye so is, right. not, is not as bad before you upsize. So no, I, it's I true. Almost, always check before, unless I'm 1,000% sure I'm, I'm in a vein. Uh, I totally you know, agree. Yeah, but if, go just, ahead. Terry, no, but if you know there's going to be, um, on your preoperative imaging, an iliac lesion you want to stent. You can't do it. I agree. No. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's funny because some people, I mean, uh, there are some people who absolutely insist on the posterior tibial vein, but really anything over eight French is, is horrible going to the posterior tibial vein. I can feel the vein just spasm right down around my sheath. I agree a hundred percent with that. Uh, Ellen, so, you know, I suppose different. if you wanted to do it all with the, you know. I think it's impossible to do everything through the posterior tibial vein, particularly if you're going to stent. You always have to stick higher afterwards. Exactly, but if you think, if you think that's you need, the easy part, as I, Tony, right? As Tony says, if you think you need to clean out the tibials, then you can do that, and like you just said, you can then access higher up once you've gotten your clearance. See, I, I take a, I take a little bit of a different tact. Uh, this is Kush. I put ten French sheets in the posterior tibial, or if there is one, a small saphenous all the time, and I do it at the high calf. I don't stick the ankle. And you can, I mean, all of the unlabeled stents are long enough that you can stent from that access. Mm -hmm. You can get clearance of the pop. You can, and to me, the, the critical determinant of patency in these patients is the profundum, the common femoral. That's what you really got to spend most of your time on, at least in my, my experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Leaving some thrombus in the pop, I don't think is that big of a deal. The profundum is open. I don't think it's going to make a difference. Ellen, I, want Ellen, I want Ellen to say something. I've asked about a hundred times. Go, Ellen. No, I, I love sticking the posterior tibial vein. And like Kush, I try to stick it high. But I, I like to clean out the popliteal. That I think their calf gets better faster with that. And if the thrombus doesn't extend through the popliteal, I then stick the superficial, superficial femoral vein somewhere in the low thigh. Just because I hate having people prone. I think that they're 
more uncomfortable, they wiggle around more, or you have to intubate them. I think your sedation and your patient comfort levels are so much better if you can have them supine. Yeah. Now, yeah. Jerry, there was a question from Anil Hingarani. Uh, do you, you had the IVUS on the table. Yes. Do you use IVUS to also tell you exactly where you should place your stent, or you just use your anatomic landmarks? Um, I, I used IVUS on this particular occasion really to document how much thrombus we were removing with the device because I, I'm a bit of a doubting Thomas. I want to see how much we actually take out rather than venography, which gives you, venography is good for the flow, but it's not very good for estimation of the actual thrombus removal for my money. Um, I knew where the lesion was on uh, CTV. It was confirmed on venography and on IVUS. I personally don't need the IVUS that much for that kind of a situation. What I think would be more important, or at least for my money, the IVUS really starts to earn its stripes when you've got a scarred or damaged common femoral, how low I'm going to stent. Um, the other thing that IVUS is really important for me is to show that the stent is fully expanded afterwards and not squished. Uh, because despite pre-dilatation, stent implantation and post-dilatation, sometimes the stent is still uh, pancaked down and, and you won't see that always on venography. So for me, that's what I've used IVUS for. Um, it does improve your outcomes though. It does. I'm getting less failures um, and I can only put it down to the intravascular ultrasound because um, it's, it's like in that, what's that, the, uh, the, the film about the football where you add up the inches and eventually you make a yard. It's, it's the little things that every time, like, for instance, not puncturing the artery, which means you can be more aggressive with your anticoagulation or, you know, choosing the right length of stent and ballooning pre and post and all the little things that add up that improve your odds and success in my experience. So, so Steve, Steve Black saying the question I kind of asked you earlier, in him, in his experience, the majority of patients with extensive DVT, the papa teals out, which is kind of my experience. So unless you're in Denmark, where you know probably seventy percent of the patients have an open popliteal vein. Um, <laughs> well, the, the Denmark paper was was I, I, I presume you're referencing Niels Bjarkard. He yeah. just excluded yeah. all of the patients with with popliteal DVT. They were just taken out of the group, you know. Yeah. So that he didn't I mean, cheat I love them. Niels, but that was, yeah. you know, that's that's and not the, real life. The only thing I just wanted is is how you do your venogram post um, lysis to evaluate your. <laughs> Um, I, I typically use uh, 20 cc's of contrast through the 10 French sheath and, uh, and just do, uh, I do AP probably and one oblique. I used to, when I didn't have IVUS, I used to do a lot more venography, but my radiation doses were much, much higher. Uh, the only thing I, some people... So now that I've got IVUS, I can pretty much assess... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you know, some people that first start getting into this, one of the mistakes is you just shoot the dye in, it flies up the vein and you think you're high fying and getting out of there. But you really, I like to do like a slow injection and just evaluate the inflow from below, either by squeezing their calf or, Agreed. or you know, just to see how good inflow you have. I agree. And I think that's particularly important when you get popliteal thrombus. And I think, um, I do believe, I, I agree with Ellen, um, that I think the, the patients improve much quicker with a patent popliteal vein. Um, and as after I've taken the sheath out, I make a particular effort to squeeze the calf. I'm really, really paranoid. And, and your pressure on the popliteal vein after you've taken the sheath out is really low. I know when my fellows start, you know, they're jamming on it like it's a common femoral artery, and that will occlude the vein. And unfortunately, I've done that a few times, and you feel particularly stupid then, um, because then you've got a puncture below that, which is a real pain. Um, but I think the pressure is quite light. And if you've done a good job and you've got inline flow, there's very little back bleeding. Jerry, did you have a no. question for the uh, panel, for the audience? Did you have a, qu a question or, or no? No, I didn't, no, sorry. Uh, is no. this your, uh, you have another case or this is the case? That is the case actually. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, then I, then, I have another, then I have another question that okay. uh, a few people have asked uh, a little bit off of it. Uh, it's acute DVT, but acute DVT of a uh, previously placed stent. The question is what other device, and I actually just did a case on, on uh, Wednesday exactly like this. Uh, what other devices aside from AngioJet can we use with a stent already in place? Can you use what the device you showed us, Jerry? I kind of don't think so. Um, I haven't actually used it in a stent at all. I would expect it would be okay because it's got a, a basket on the outside. 
Um, what have I used? I suppose the first thing I would say is that um, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. So it's a very valid question. Um, the number of stents being placed has risen dramatically. Um, if I'm getting, say, 10% annual thrombosis, I would expect others are getting equally that level or higher, particularly when I see eight and 10 millimeter stents going to the common iliac vein. So I think it's a really worthwhile question. The device that I'd use probably most is Asperex by Straub. Um, that is um, no, eight, in eight in a 10 French and Straub has been just bought out by BD. Uh, that is, I think the Rotorex, well, uh, they will be in the United States fairly, fairly shortly. Right. There is um, a well, high- how about, how about Penumbra? Can, can't the Penumbra device be used? Penumbra, absolutely, absolutely. It, it's not, I think most devices are, are useful going through it. Um, the critical factor is how acute the thrombus is. If the thrombus is over six weeks old, I find there's a rubber cap at each end of the stent and it's really difficult to get through. Yeah. Um, but in an acute situation, the number is ideal actually, yeah. yeah. So what the, case, the, the device you just showed, you just have to be careful it doesn't get caught. On the stent, right. right. I think so. That's, that's the issue. Go ahead. With, with the newer stents, one of the things that probably well, you can appreciate when you take them out is that with the wall stent, it's, it's a very round concentric uh, stainless steel woven uh, algaloy. But with the laser cut nitinols, you, get, you can get sort of fish tailing like that, or fish scaling rather. And some of the, um, the angles can come into the middle of the stent and once I very stupidly lost access and then managed to get my wire through the interstices, which was a disaster. So I think you have to be a little bit more careful with the laser cut night and all stents. Jerry, one important question is, as you saw your, on your eyeballs, what's the predictive value for failure, the remaining amount of unresolved thrombus in, in the vein and how aggressive you are with this? It's a very good question and I would actually say that I don't know enough about IVUS. I've been using IVUS now for around four or five years and I'm getting better at it. But do I have enough information that tells me when something's going to fail and when it's not? I would probably go more on the rapidity of flow on venography. Um, and if the flow is quite rapid, then I'm much more comfortable. When I've got stagnant flow, I feel as if I've missed something. And so then I will put the IVUS through it and usually I either have missed a segment or I haven't ballooned up aggressively enough, even though I've ballooned, I think, pretty aggressively. Um, but I don't think IVUS tells me enough. Certainly, if you've, got, if you've got something which is basically stuffed full, then clearly it's not going to work. But you won't have flow on venography then either. So I don't know. I'd probably pass that on to people who've been doing IVUS for, for a longer period than I have. Maybe, I don't know, Steve Black or, or Steve Elias or a variety of people, I'm sure. Ellen? Okay, go ahead. Oh. Oh, Steve. Uh, I, I don't know. I can I can comment if you like. Uh, I think I think the the limitation with IVIS for determining success is more about making sure you got the technical things right. It doesn't. It's it, it, there's nothing in it that will tell you that um, uh, you've got perfect flow at the end. To Jerry's point, it doesn't have flow measurement or anything on it. You can kind of infer from what the image looks like. If it's a dark black in the middle of the stent, you've generally got a high flow. If, it, if it's a snowstorm, sort of gray appearance, then that's more of a concern. But, you know, that's a, a kind of very subjective assessment. So I think the, the uh, hope is that IVIS will start to incorporate things that, that have direct flow measurement going forward, and they've got some stuff on the horizon that will start to help with that. But at the moment, to me, it's more a tool of getting the technical landing zones right, having a stent in the perfect place, making sure you've got uh, a place to put the stent to the contents of the profunda and femoral vein and that you put it in the right place uh, at the main vein of crossing. That's, yeah. the, that's the main use. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, but, but Jerry, you started out your talk, which I, I think is really, kind of, I'd like to sum, sum up uh, this segment in that um, the algorithm, as you say, for treating acute uh, deep venous thrombosis now is changing. And I see yeah. almost no reason why one would not start with a non-thrombolytic device okay. first in a patient that, you know, is a pretty acute-ish DVT. You get it out mm. great, like you make the point with uh, with
without using TPA. And then if you have residual stuff and you think you still need to do more, you then may add on a, uh, you know, thrombolysis in, in, in some manner. But in my mind, I agree. The algorithm, we have some very good non-thrombolytic devices now out there. Yeah. Uh, we start that way and you, you work your way up. And, and just to finish it, that's exactly what I did on, on Wednesday with the thrombose 10. Started with a, um, actually a flow treever. And, yeah. then, and then went to uh, AngioJet to kind of clean it up. But it's short the procedure, minimize the TPA. So what I take away from this, and I think others too, is that the algorithm really is, uh, is changing. And, this is, and that's really opposite of what attracted. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they didn't have this stuff. Steve, that, you know. so, I mean, Steve, there's two real important lessons from attracted to say that that's why we should be going in that direction. Yeah. And yeah. The one is that the, ble the bleeding risk from attract. Uh, was strongly positive against treatment, and that is purely related to TPA dosing. The more you yeah. eliminate TPA, the more you yeah. can change that. And the second part is the cost effectiveness argument. We know that TPA is heinously expensive, and if we're going to make this cost effective, we have to limit yeah. it. So there's yeah. two very good reasons for limiting TPA uh, and moving towards uh, PA. Yeah. And, and just the final, final mm -hmm. point I'd make is that and I, I know we're under time pressure to move on. The, the discussion with the patient is really different. It's it's a different discussion yeah. because uh, the, the, the patient after this, or that we did, was was a 20-year-old uh, accountancy student, uh, came in, big DVT, on the pill, standard stuff. Um, and her first question was, are you going to use catheter-directed thrombolysis because I've read it can give a stroke? You know, people are Google savvy nowadays. They're looking up stuff, particularly on with COVID times. they got all the time in the world to look at stuff. So if you can say... Well, to be honest, we're going to use a device which uses as little TPA as possible. If we have to, if we have to, we may use a tiny dose. But I do not intend to put you on a three or four day infusion where you're, you're at a bigger risk. And you can feel the tension in the room go down because you've changed it from being a, a swollen leg with a risk for a stroke to a vacuum cleaner. And people are comfortable with vacuum cleaners. A healthy lymphatic system absorbs and transports lymph fluid from the subcutaneous tissue back to the bloodstream. Lymph is transported through lymph vessels to lymph nodes where it is filtered and detoxified before being returned to the venous circulation. When the lymphatic system has not developed properly or lymph nodes or vessels have been removed or damaged, the lymph fluid may not drain properly. This disruption of the lymphatic system may result in chronic swelling in the affected regions. The FlexiTouch Plus system is an advanced pneumatic compression device that has been clinically proven to reduce chronic swelling and stimulate lymphatic function. The patented curved chambers of the garment lie perpendicular to the lymphatic pathways and apply gentle dynamic pressure. This wave-like motion helps the capillaries to open and receive lymph fluid. The lymph fluid is then channeled into segments called lymphangians, which contract to facilitate the lymph fluid movement into the next segment. This enables directional movement of the excess fluid from the affected regions of the lower extremities to healthy regions, returning the fluid to the venous circulation and delivering significant and measurable results over time. The FlexiTouch Plus system offers patients a clinically proven approach to self-management at home and the opportunity to achieve improved levels of health and quality of life. For more information about the FlexiTouch Plus system, visit tactilemedical.com. Okay, thank you once again, our industry partners, whom we could not be having this meeting without. We want to thank, thank Tactile Medical. Uh, next, Stephen Black is up, uh, giving us a case of combined superficial and deep venous uh, disease. So um, these, are, these are two cases I've been asked to look at something uh, which is slightly different, which is combined uh, superficial and deep disease. Uh, so the, these are two slightly unusual cases for me, but I think the overall message is that you should you know, not worry about treating superficial disease when there's deep veins uh, present. So uh, we'll, we'll go through that. Um, so the first patient is a, a, a 24 
who was to me uh, and was known to have uh, lymphedema dystichiasis syndrome, uh, which is uh, a, a FOXY2 gene mutation. So the question uh, really for anybody who's smart is how can you identify this without having to know that they have it when you first see your patients? Uh, and it's a slightly tenuous thing. Some of you will probably know this. Anyway, the uh, FOXY2 gene mutation is, uh, as, as well as causing lymphedema and causing a, a Belvey genesis, which is why they get varicose veins, is associated with double eyelashes. So if you uh, creepily, uh, and Jerry, you're not allowed to do this because people would get freaked out, is look deeply in the eyes, you'll spot the uh, double row of eyelashes, which tells you that they've got uh, lymphedema just to <laughs> <laughs> so, Jesus, uh, I can't believe the crap I take from this guy. God. Oh, I'm not on music. So the, uh, the, the main, uh, the main um, uh, issue with this girl was she got to a point of being very bothered by superficial varicose veins uh, and was increasingly self-conscious. Actually, interestingly, despite having lymphedema dystichiasis, the gene penetration is variable. So she didn't have lymphedema that was too bad. It was actually quite well controlled and she could get through most of the summer without having to wear stockings as, long, as well as, as long as she was compliant with the manual lymphatic drainage uh, regimen. So I, uh, I got a duplex scan and this is what it is. So uh, Nikos, I apologize in advance that throughout I've just got some reports um, and not the actual pictures. Uh, so uh, please forgive me for that. Um, it's because I'm not on a plane to New York so I felt I could cheapskate this one. You know? um, so, uh, when I saw this time when we did this scan, um, she already had her GSV in her right leg treated. Uh, she had anterior thigh vein reflux on the right hand side with lots of varicosities and, and multiple perforators that were incompetent. And she had uh, GSV reflux on the left hand side. Interestingly, both the, the short and uh, saphness on both sides was, was variably competent. So there were some functioning valves that went orthopedic on, which fits with the variable penetrance. Uh, and really lots of visible varicosities uh, in both legs and thighs. Uh, and throughout, a deep system is completely incompetent, axial reflux on both sides. So, Steve, so, wait, Stephen, can you just give yes. us a little sense of, I know you said she was bothered by it, bothered by it in the way it, it looked, more than the way it felt. What, what, was, what about the varicose veins bothered her? So she was mainly bothered by, by the appearance. Uh, you know, she was really, really self-conscious and really, uh, you know, very uh, concerned by the appearance. And she had over many times over the years been told that she can't have any treatment for her veins because of her underlying uh, genetic uh, predisposition yep. to them. Uh, she uh, was surprisingly mild symptoms, you know, and this goes to varicose veins, which is why they're so hard to present. Here's somebody who her entire life has had no functional venous valves. Uh, has got deep and superficial reflux, which is fairly gross, but has uh, very limited skin changes. Uh, Stephen, did she have swelling? Uh, she got swelling. And what was the distribution? Uh, it, it, swelling in her foot and ankles and up to about the mid calf when it was, you know, when she didn't do her manual lymphatic drainage. But actually, the swelling was quite well managed and intermittent. Right. So no, no, C4, no C4 changes? At all? No, C, no C4 changes at all. So, okay, so we have a C2 that really just doesn't like how it looks. Pretty much, okay. pretty much. But with this, you know, this background of deep and superficial vein disease, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next. So uh, the questions really would uh, be to everybody would be, how would you treat this? So I think I've sent some questions through. Yes, you have. There they are. Yeah. So every everybody, all of you who are attending, who are listening to this can vote, take your mouse and click on what you would do here. So, um, you know, basically giving the options there of, of from nothing to, you know, just do some sort of Chiva technique to get rid of the varicosities that are bothering you, leave everything else behind, get rid of the veins. I mean, this is C2, but, you know, the question is for this girl when she's young is how, how much is this going to progress over time is probably part of it. All right, let's see what the everyone thought. So of those of you who said to treat the superficial veins, yes would mean only to take care of the visible varicosities. No would mean to take care of the varicosities plus the uh, superficial axial incompetence. So if you answer yes to this question, you say, yeah, I just want to take care of the varicosities. If you say no, it means you want to do 
superficial axial, you know, an ablation plus varicosities. So if we all could vote here. Yes is only varicosities. No is varicosities and some type of ablation, whatever you're gonna use. Okay. Okay, so most people are gonna do everything. Most people are gonna do everything, okay. So um, wait, 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 that, that wait, is wait, if you plan to do go, Yes, before you go, Raghu, what, what do you think? These are difficult patients, especially with congenital lymphedema, what you do for them and what the expectations should be set um, um, and how um, aggressive you should be in treating these patients and how that could potentially um, worsen the lymphedema is all um, a huge discussion you need to have with the patients. And I'm sure uh, Steve had all of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Regu is the principal thing here is expectation setting, isn't it? And yeah. and really being clear on the symptoms and what the motivation for treatment is. Because right. uh, Nick, you know, what would you all. do? All likelihood, nothing will change in terms of her edema. <coughs> but you know, she's had she's had obviously lymphedema, congenital lymphedema. Uh, to just treat the superficial venous disease. Probably nothing's going to change. Even patients without congenital lymphedema that's had chronic swelling. A lot of the times, the one thing that doesn't get better or doesn't improve significantly is the swelling. Yeah, no, I don't, but that was not her goal. Her goal is she doesn't like how the veins look. Helen, what are your thoughts? Well, then you treat them like any other uh, cosmetic shirt intervention. Right. Yeah, right. that was my point as well, Steve, that what I got from Stephen's presentation wasn't, it was that she, you know, uh, was not bothered by swelling and not bothered by lymphedema, but didn't like the cosmetics. I guess the reason that I would do a little more than just do the visible varicosities in this woman is that she's obviously going to have more problems long term than the average patient. And so if by doing smaller procedures and ablating the incompetent superficial veins and then treating the visible varicosities, that might keep her satisfied for longer than if you just did isolated phlebectomies or injections in the ones that were visually bothering her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna say I was at 20% in this particular patient, it's so rare I do that, just doing the visible varicosities. But in this person, I thought less is a little best in terms of not fooling around with um, theoretically, the lymphatic system, but also what she wanted to accomplish. And your, the saphenous vein, it was not a huge vein, if I remember, Stephen, was yeah. it? Uh, Stephen? No. Right. So, so here's another. There's thing. the measurement set. Yeah. There's. An, I mean, you know, it's not tiny, but it's not. You. I mean, in my mind, I, I again setting her expectations. Five, five to five to eight millimeters at the knee, five below the knee. Yeah. The, the saphenous vein. I mean, I don't know. Okay, so anyhow, go, wait, keep going. So those were the options. So what did I do? I, I, I was in the 80% in this one. Mainly, I spent quite a lot of time counseling this, uh, this young lady with her mother and her father, talking about whether there was any benefit to treatment or not. And I, and I didn't do it first up. And she'd also seen two or three people who told her that she should never have her veins touched. So this message before there was quite a lot of anxiety about even even anything to do with it. And she had got herself into quite an emotional state about her, her veins. And she was, she was quite an attractive girl uh, who was extremely socially bothered by the by the veins in her leg. It had become a really big uh, mental thing for her. So I eventually did the the, the GSV and the ATV with uh, RF and I did some avulsions, uh, uh, superficial phlebectomies. I didn't do any foam. Um, and she manages the intermittent swelling of her legs quite well. But actually, this was two years ago. She's had very little recurrence. Her legs are still good, and, and I got a Christmas card from her. I hardly ever get Christmas cards from patients. It, uh, I must be an asshole to them. I don't know what it is, but anyway, I occasionally do, and she wrote me a Christmas card uh, saying that I'd, you know, telling me she got engaged and that her life had been fundamentally transformed by her veins being taken out, which was a surprise to me because, you know, you don't always understand how, how, how much... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. great. Now you have another case or no? Hey, before you go, uh, regarding your, so, your I, reflux, yeah. uh, in a patient like that, I wouldn't worry much because this reflux induced by the superficial vein sufficiency. And uh, we do the superficial veins, 
the reflux will disappear, particularly in this case, you have non post robotic reflux in the femoropopetial yes. veins, which is on the axis yes. of the great and the small saphenous veins. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where I was going with this also, Nikos. I agree. But there's yeah. more than one way. Steve, to... I've got a question yes. for you, Lowell Kavnick. Uh, yes, we, uh, we always uh, were concerned about using a thermal ablation in lymphedema. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot of reports, but this is kind of common knowledge that we talked about. Uh, but you went on and did thermal. Would, would you have considered a non-thermal device? And has anybody out there seen uh, making it worse with thermal? I have, I have seen a couple that got worse um, uh, after uh, thermal ablation, Lowell. I think we spoke about that. So I have, uh, uh, for my combined patients, especially with the, the ones with the lymphedema, primary lymphedema or congenital lymphedema, I typically use non-thermals. Uh, so, uh, Lowell, in answer to your question, at the time I, I didn't have glue available. Um, so I may consider glue now, but in a young patient, I'm also slightly, you know, you have to discuss the risk of, yeah. of, of other complications related to glue. I'm not a big fan. Uh, I know some people get really good results, but I, I wouldn't really be a huge fan of, of foaming the, the great saphenous vein above the knee. It's just something that I'm not um, totally comfortable doing. I prefer other techniques. If you look at the literature, the, the rate of deterioration of lymphedema for, for fleba lymphedema in patients with... Um, with thermal treatments is probably about half a percent. There was a Paul Pitaluga published a, a review on this and, and there's really sparse literature as you say, but it's about half to 1% will get, will get worse. So that was part of the counseling. She didn't have much in the way of, um, of uh, swelling to start off with. So I, I wasn't convinced we'd make it a huge amount worse if there was a little bit of change. And I confined the thermal technique to above the knee only. So I didn't come below the knee and stayed, you know, a, a good couple of centimeters from the core. All right, Steve, I you have another case? Thank you. Steve, you, have another, you have another case, Steve? Yeah. Kind of, uh, yeah. let's, let's go to the next one. All right. So uh, this next guy is a slightly different problem. It also, it's a combined deep superficial vein discussion and follows on a little bit from yesterday's talk. So there's, there's a bit of overlap here. This was a 40-year-old male who came to see me with a history of IgG kappa myeloma, which he ultimately required stem cell transplant for after failed uh, bouts of chemotherapy and a partial response to VTD, but he was now in complete remission. But during the course of uh, the stem cell transplant, immunotherapy, and so on, he had developed uh, quite a, a nasty ulcer in his left medial malleolus. It wasn't particularly big, but just wasn't healing. Uh, so he got referred by his hematologist to, to see me, and the hematologist requested a duplex scan before he came, and the letter really just spoke about the myeloma. And he came to see me in the clinic in October 2018. I'm, he's still a patient of mine now, so this, this feeds into the, into the story. And this was uh, the duplex that he came with. Again, uh, Nikos, apologies for no, for no pictures and, and not one of you is Godfather. I mean, you like to put that in. Uh, so he had uh, thrombophobitis changes in his short saphenous vein, which was almost completely occluded. And the distal GSV uh, in the calf and ankle was, was, uh, was gone, but he had this sort of refluxing perforator sitting just under the ulcer in his ankle. And he had quite a lot of scarring in the deep veins with some reflux in the deep system. So, uh, and the veins above the groin with my ultrasound text said the common femoral vein looked normal. So I took a little bit more of a detailed history from him. It turned out he had had a DVT 14 years before this when he was 26. Uh, with no recurrence after that, he had had six months of anticoagulation at the time and, and, and never had it again. And he was diagnosed at the time with factor V Leiden mutation, which was homozygous and protein C deficiency. So he clearly had quite extensive changes, and I think he's probably had phlebitis during the course of his chemotherapy and immune suppression, and uh, probably a more extensive DVT than had been accounted for 14 years ago. So the question is, when, when you see somebody like this, what are you going to do next? And I've sent you some questions again, Steve, so you can put those up. You know, uh, he's not had much treatment for the Spain, so uh, what, what, what do we think we should do with him? Okay, so everybody vote and submit. Okay. 
Okay, we got some answers. Okay, so that's uh, interesting uh, to me, actually. Uh, so um, I don't know if anybody's got comments there, but, but you know, when I pick up somebody like this with a history of, of, of DVT and extensive lower limb changes, which is a surprise to me, I, I find it hard not to consider doing more proximal imaging other than just the duplex scan. Um, what, what does anybody else think? Because the majority here almost are in favor of just treating the perforator and doing some compression. I, I would agree with you. Um, I would agree with you, Stephen, because in a, particularly with a history, as you've suggested, and a history of malignancy, you said factor five Leiden, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they've got factor five Leiden and they've got a malignancy. I think it's important to rule out a proximal uh, obstructing lesion or a proximal extensive uh, iliofemoral scarring and DVT because uh, I suppose I'm a bit biased because I work in a hospital with so much cancer, but uh, it is much more common than you think. Uh, yeah, so that, uh, I, no, I agree. agree, Steve. Uh, but Ragu, wait, wait, Ragu, what would you, what's your thoughts on this? You see these people all the time. Absolutely. Uh, th that's someone uh, I would, I would get more imaging, Steve, uh, with previous history of DVT and <clears throat> Um, and uh, prothrombin, I'm, I'm sorry, not prothrombin, factor five Leiden homozygosity and uh, protein C deficiency, absolutely. Um, I would like to see more because I'm not sure that perforator itself is the sole culprit in this. Yeah, it just seemed a, a little bit low to me. It was quite a nice looking ulcer. So, um, and he had quite a lot of lipidematosclerosis changes already with, with uh, I have a picture of his foot later, not at the time when he presented it. So you'll see the skin changes uh, Later yeah. on. Okay, so I, I, I get an MRV in these patients as a starting point, and I like MRV because we get good MRVs, and uh, you're not using contrast, you're not using radiation, and it's pretty straightforward and just gives you an idea of whether something else is going on. As good as duplex is, and my, my duplex techs are not nearly as good as uh, NECOS is, and uh, they don't pick up uh, a lot of the stuff. But Nobody's as good as NECOS, he just pisses us all off. Yeah, this is a fair, fair point, Jerry, well made. Um, so the MR scan said uh, possible extrinsic compression of the common iliac vein between the artery and vertebral body with some, uh, you know, uh, a strong suggestion of Maytherna and uh, high grade post thrombotic changes within the femoral and popliteal veins. So that fitted with the duplex, um, but on the MR there was a clear suggestion of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, compression. So what did I do next? So I, I tend to, in these patients, then do an IVUS to confirm it. And I had a very long conversation with the patient before about if we did an IVUS, were we going to stent them at the same time or were we going to just treat the perforator and compression, but at least we knew if there was a, a strong lesion. And, and my feeling on this was if I found a 90% a compression of Mather and I was going to treat it, but if it was borderline, we'd, we'd see how he went. And actually, the IVUS showed... The, the Maytherna and a, another compression point at the at the confluence of the external and internal iliac veins from the overriding artery, both about sixty percent, and the rest of the vein look look normal. So did the question you inflate is, a balloon at those compression points. Yeah, yeah, I did, and 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 there was there was clearly some extrinsic compression. Yeah, but it so, wasn't more critical than sixty percent. No, it was, it was, you know, the, the balloon, a 14 balloon would come through with a little bit of hold up at those two points, but, but there was still rapid drainage and contrast. And it wasn't, you know, it was one of those, uh, Paul, where the video study it sits on the fence, you know, so yeah. I, I kind of, and this guy with all the risks for him was, was, was not sure where to go. So uh, the second question here is what would everybody do based on the, the, the MRV, which is convincing, and an IVUS, which showed 60% compression by area criteria, two points. Uh, hey, in Steve, the a couple of uh, clinical questions uh, for me here that I'm struggling with. So this 40-year-old man with m myeloma um, um, and two, um, you know, very powerful um, hypercoagulable states, and I was um, somewhat surprised and underwhelmed with the MR report, um, I don't know if you were too or not. I thought it would be a long post-thrombotic area in the iliac vein, um, but this is just an obstruction. And yeah, it wasn't, and, and that's, that's yeah. And and seems like you know the 
Is the pathology mostly infrainguinal leading to this issue then? Um, then it, the other question is what was the anticoagulation on, on this patient? Because uh, in the thought process, I'm thinking that if I refer this patient for stenting and because of his three hypercoagulable states, if that stent starts, you know, plugging up over and over whatever remainder of the life he has for his multiple myeloma, um, would not be that great as, is what I'm uh, thinking. Yeah, so he, he, he's, in complete, he's in complete remission from the myeloma. Okay, good. He wasn't on anticoagulation, it got referred to me, but whatever, I thought he had significant risk factors that I was putting him on thromboprophylaxis anyway, regardless of what we did. So uh, in this case, I'd use a fixaban. Uh, so, and I agree with you, I was underwhelmed by the outflow tract. I was expecting more. It was much less than I thought. That's why we did the IVIS and venogram in addition to the MRV, because, uh, you know, MRs, probably 80 to 90% sensitive and specific, you're gonna miss stuff if you if you go purely on that. Yeah, so Stephen, a lot of the discussion that's going on in the in the chat here, most people are saying, yes, they would not stent at this time. And most people are saying that they'll they'll take care of the perforator and do some foam around, around the ulcer bed. I agree with that myself personally, but I would also, what I'd also do at the same time, Jerry, I would access the posterior tibial vein I no, it's artery, no? And 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 Tony and I have already we we presented data on this at meetings. We have not published it yet, except in Bain Magazine. Um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, in terms of doing some type of angioplasty of the uh, chronically uh, diseased uh, popliteal and uh, femoral vein, understanding it's not going to be durable for the rest of this patient's life, but that may be durable enough to get some better venous outflow enough to heal the ulcer. So in my mind, I would do angioplasty of the popliteal femoral and deal with the uh, peri-ulcer area with the perforator and the um, peri-ulcer uh, varicosities. That's and Steve, it. can I ask you, would you would you use overnight echos catheter directed no. thrombolysis? No, no, no. What Tony and I have, have spoken about is a, a single session uh, thrombolysis and angioplasty. There's a catheter called the chameleon catheter which has an infusion port below the balloon, meaning closer to your, um, your the, the, the lower part, not at the tip. So what you do is you, you place the balloon up right above where you're gonna start your angioplasty. You locally instill some thrombolytic agent, TPA, in that area right below the balloon. You let it sit for a while. You pull your balloon down, you balloon that area. You then, while you're doing that, you, you put TPA in, this, in the um, area right below that balloon and you kind of work your way down. Whether the TPA adds something or not, we don't know, we, we only, we, but we did do uh, 21 patients and 19 of them had ulcers. And of those 19, 16 did heal the ulcers uh, after we did this. Everything else had already been done, including optimal wound care. So- That's pretty cool, that's it's pretty an cool. Idea, it's, in my mind, it's like you're doing an angioplasty of a popliteal tibial artery on a gangrenous toe, and yes, if it works long enough to heal the toe, but then goes down, not as bad. Same idea behind this. So it's a it's minimal risk with some some gain. I think. And, and Steve, this is Paul. I I would agree with yeah. you, but I think part of my decision process on this depends on how much of an ulcer and how much skin damage there is. If this is more of a focal ulcer with not a lot of diffuse skin damage then I might go after the perforator, but yeah. if you're seeing diffuse damage, which Stephen will show us the picture, then I would agree wholeheartedly with you that treating the deep venous system, as you described, is, is appropriate. Yeah, so just to just to answer that then, this this guy, his ulcer was not a big ulcer, but it was you know just one of those really painful, nasty looking ulcers, not huge. And he, he had a lot of lipidematosclerosis, but not much swelling. So in my view, going after the deep system at this point, that chronically, and he had reflux, but his deep veins were of a reasonable caliber. So I thought okay. we could manage that first with compression and see how that got on. Okay. Steve, so, would, Steve Black, what I would say to you, this is Paul, what's impressive and what's not always appreciated by uh, transcutaneous duplex ultrasound is the vein may be open, but what you see when you balloon these, these veins is that there are focal areas of webs and strictures that do not allow the vein to expand. Mm. And, and so what happens is, I think what happens in part by ballooning these things is you actually change the compliance of that conduit. 
by stretching out the vein to its normal size and breaking up some of those strictures under exercise conditions and otherwise, yeah. I think the vein functions better. No, I, uh, I, no, I, I, yeah. I'll take that. I agree, I, with, I agree with that. I, but I think the point of this is, while it might not be appropriate in this patient, Stephen, if you're telling us the way uh, the ulcers look, I think we need to keep this a little bit more in our mind uh, than we have in the past. We've kind of ignored the uh, femoral popliteal uh, segment hmm. with chronic disease. So if there's minimal risk, and there's potential benefit in the right patient, I think all of us should consider a little bit more being more aggressive. And yes, and we need to get data and see does it really matter or not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. so well, let, let, me, let, let me tell you what I did because there's more to this case and we'll run out of time. So we've yes. got to whip through the, yes. uh, what, what actually happened. So uh, I didn't stent him first up. So I put in some, fo I foamed the perforator, I put in compression and I waited. And then three months later, based on the fact that I thought the findings were borderline and I had done some venograms of the lower leg and there was pretty reasonable clearage of contrast from his lower leg. I also really hadn't healed much. And, and this guy was quite frustrated with it. He'd been there for a long time. And we had spoken a lot uh, in this interval time about whether or not a stent would be a benefit. And, and so eventually I decided to stent him. You can see a picture of the stent to the left. So that's really just a straightforward mate burner. There was a compression the external and uh, compression of the main burner point, but actually relatively normal looking, looking veins. So uh, but straight after that, this is now 12, uh, 12 weeks after the stent. He's also nearly healed, but he had gone to see a podiatrist because he had an ingrown toenail who removed his toenail and this is his toe. And he came back to me with his toe looking like this. Out of all his compression, because he couldn't be in compression with a toe, and he also had gone backwards again completely. Uh, so, uh, one year on, we had then started to try and get him managing his, his toe and his perforator and his bandages and his ulcers. And a year later, uh, I'd done further foam to the ulcer bed on two or three occasions in this. Uh, we rescanned him uh, just to see where things are. The perforator had opened up again. The stent was completely patent, but he still had not healed and his toe and ulcer had not healed. And this is what his toe looked like now. You, you know, this is now nine months on from the, the toe. Does he have uh, palpable uh, pulses? I know he's 40, but he could have had an arterial occlusion as well. Uh, I, I did I did an arterial duplex scan completely normal. And he had palpable pulses, but I did a duplex scan anyway, just to, to be sure. So this is what his toe looks like. This is now an ulcer, also on the lateral malleolus, which he developed. And this is where his ulcer got to. Now, this picture, the original ulcer had started there and gone to there. So it'd been this whole sort of area of his malleolus. So we'd got it to this point, but it never got it to close up. So it had just been sitting static like this. And I've foamed this now four times under the ulcer bed. He's, he's the, had compression. Yeah. The, the toe, um, any imaging for infection, osteo? Uh, yes, I, we did an MRI of his foot and uh, plain x-rays. A uh, plain x-rays looked normal. So then we did an MRI, no osteomyelitis. And he's been on anticoagulation this whole time? Anticoagulation throughout, yeah. And had no recurrence or remission of his, of his um, malignancy. So did you take his toe off? Uh, no. So here's the thing. So uh, what I did at this point was we sat down and had a bit of a chat about what was going on with the compression. And what it turned out was that uh, when he had his toe off, he had changed his compression bandaging. And he had um, he'd gone out of compression bandaging because they couldn't put it on because of his toe. And he had started using a double layer of open toe class uh, two compression stockings. So he put two of them on. Uh, and intermittently his toe would get bad and then he would stop wearing his stockings and then he also would get bad. And then he'd start wearing his stockings again and his toe would get bad. So what I did at this point was I phoned this lateral malleolar ulcer because I'd never treated that side. And I changed him to two closed toe compression stockings. And everything is now healed. Okay. So his use of compression had totally stuffed up the healing of something that should have healed over time. But he had been doing his own thing. This guy is, is uh, you know, he's uh, an investment banker and he does uh, a lot of idiosyncratic stuff. But it was the way he was using compression. So every time he came in, he had clearly been in compression. I could see he'd been in compression but he was on his own changing his compression regimen and that had messed things up. And the closed 
across this entire thing from a year's saga of nothing changing to being healed. Hey, Stephen, so, did you, Steve, did you use any pharmacologic therapy, any pentoxifiline, any Daflon, anything like that? Statins? We, 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 we can't get Daflon. He's on statins uh, uh, and he's on, uh, and he's on the Pixabat. Uh, so we can't get Daflon in, in, in the UK, so don't use that. So um, at the moment, they, they're pretty much healed now. Uh, so he has been healed for the first time in ages with a change in his compression. The perforator are foamed again, so we'll see if that seals. I, I really didn't want to put a laser into, the perforator was directly under that skin of the ulcer, so to try and get into it, I thought would be difficult. Uh, given this, this something to the point that people made, should, should I go back and class these deep veins to the point Steve oh, made? Should I have done something else to the perforator? Is there something else going on that we need to think about? Because I'm sure this is going to recur. Hey, Steve, Mark Garcia, if he were on the panel, would say, do my access PTS type of protocol, right? Um, yeah, that's, what, that's exactly what we were talking about here. Yeah. Um, before, about taking care of the femoropopatial segment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, we do that quite frequently. And, and this guy just sort of, you know, uh, with the absence of evidence, it's hard to know. And, and I, I agree with that. If I'd done that earlier, should I? I mean, this is the, this is the question here. Yeah, we've, we've taken a year and a half to heal this ulcer, which is All tedious. Right. Yeah? But, but we don't want to take a year and a half with this case because we got more to go. So mm. let's finish up here. <laughs> Sorry to take it in there. All right. So something else going on. Most people think something else going on. Keep going, Stephen. You have a summary or this is it? That's it. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Now, now it's for you to tell me what to do. I mean, you know, there we go. I think what the, the lesson for me is the stocking for a big revelation. Yeah. I missed that completely. So clearly I'm, I'm a bit thick on that. I should have picked up on that earlier and changed into closed toe compression a long time ago. But, um, you know. Well, all right. But he still maintained his healing now, right? Yeah. All right. So good. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, panelists. So prior to the onset of my condition, I was limited on what I was able to do. I was experiencing a lot of fatigue. I wasn't myself. I, I had like headaches. I had pain all, all over my upper leg, my lower leg. I've been to many, many other doctors and for some reason or other, no one was able to detect exactly what was causing the tremendous amount of pain that I was having. We took uh, PESI to Cedar sinai Hospital cath lab and performed an intravascular ultrasound and found that her compression in the iliac veins is much more severe than we found with MRI. Based on the findings of the intravascular ultrasound showing 75% compression on one side and 52% compression on the other side, right and left. We went ahead and put stents in the iliac veins and treated the compression. We got rid of the compression. We were delighted to see her in follow-up and it's been now almost a year after the procedure where all her symptoms have completely vanished. So now it's truly amazing. I'm a completely different person. I'm able to come and go when I want. In fact, I just got back from a cruise. Me and a friend went to the Panama Canal and it was amazing. I am pain-free and I just feel like I'm able to get on with life. Thank you, and we thank Phillips again for, for their support during this uh, meeting. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the um, BARD vernacular trial using the Venovo uh, stent, um, and specifically the results at two years um, from uh, follow-up. Um, disclosures, and um, you're probably familiar with, with this stand. I think it's been released in the United States now for some time. Uh, it's a self-expanding nitinol stand. Um, slight flaring of the outer ends, um, quite flexible, good radial force. Um, I wouldn't say it's a second generation stand because, you know, we're still at early stages of all stents really, I suppose, but it probably has learned from some of the other stents that have been out there. Um, 
delivery system is, is triaxial. Uh, it's an 035 system over the wire. Um, and then it's got, um, for those of you who haven't used it, it's got a larger thumb wheel and a smaller thumb wheel and uh, a safety lock here. And it comes in two lengths, shaft lengths of 80 and 120. I'm doing a lot of my work from the, uh, from the neck. And so the 120 shafts are particularly handy if you have tall patients. Um, it does come in a large range of sizes and diameters, and that is a, mm -hmm. uh, that is a nice factor. Uh, so you're up to 20 millimeters diameter and down to 10, and then quite a, a broad range of lengths as well. So I think what I've learned from the people who are doing an awful lot of stenting, so the Michael Lichtenberg, Stephen Blacks, uh, some of the European specialists, um, they take a lot of care in choosing their stent length and often land if, I mean, it's fairly straightforward in, in, in the simpler uh, uh, cases. Jerry? Yes. One thing you forgot. Can you go to presentation mode? Oh, okay. Yeah, for some reason, uh, on the, um, on the, whatever way it's come over from um, Bart, it, it won't allow me okay. to do that. So All I right. apologize. No problem. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I, it, it worked yesterday and it doesn't work today. So right. kind of like a lot of things for me. Anyway, keep going, keep going. okay, fair enough. Um, so what I've learned from the people who are doing an awful lot of stenting, and I do a fair bit, but some of these guys are doing like a ton of it, is to choose your landing zones really carefully and then tailor your stents along that. So specifically not to have an overlap of two uh, stents underneath the inguinal ligament uh, or if uh, so your overlap point is a, away from that point so the the trial that you're all quite familiar with i'm sure is a prospective non-randomized uh, multi-center single arm study uh, in iliofemoral venous occlusive disease um <clears throat> pardon me uh, prospect prospective multi-center um core lab um so there's a wide variety of centers in the united states and overseas and um, 170 subjects was, is the, the number that typically is being used in most of the venous stent trials. And it primarily is primary patency at 12 months and freedom from major adverse events at 30 days. And your secondary endpoints are VCSS, yeah. vitro technical success, uh, freedom from TVR and primary patency, as well as X-ray analysis of stent fracture. Um, the Critical aspect, I suppose, in this trial for me was that the FDA mandated a certain proportion of patients were acute, some were chronic, um, and there was a limitation in the number of nivels. So for those of you who are familiar with placing venous stents, if you just treat non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, your patency rates are going to be incredibly high and the patients are going to do incredibly well. But nobody knows, although Paul Gagne's data would suggest that 61% at least would be the percentage of stenosis by IVUS before one places a stent. Um, in the, the harder cases are obviously the post-thrombotics. And you can see that on an intention to treat basis, uh, there was a 93.5% uh, freedom from major adverse events, uh, with, um, which far exceeded the, the performance goal. Um, and the primary patency uh, at 12 months was considerably higher based on a literature review uh, from Mahmoud Razavi of, of uh, several or a couple of thousand uh, venous stenting episodes prior to this. So 82 or 88 percent uh, far superior to 74 percent and that was obviously very statistically significant. And if you look at the the numbers extending out to 24 months as opposed to 12 months, obviously the the number of patients isn't quite as high uh, because they haven't all hit their, their two-month goals uh, two-year goals, rather, pardon me, but um, the percentage drop-off is very mild indeed, and it's comforting to know that there's zero strength, stent fractures. And then if you look on the right-hand slide, you can see that the proportion of those that are uh, PTS versus nivel, the nivels obviously have a higher percentage, but the patencies uh, in, the, um, in the PTS group, uh, they're real. I mean, those are the numbers that, that one achieves at best, uh, in these patients because they're, they're a difficult group of patients. They've already shown a propensity to thrombose, and so they're, they're difficult from that aspect. Um, and over time, you are going to lose one or two here and there. Um, so in summary, um, the, the stent exceeded expectations compared to uh, the, the primary literature. 
um, and your primary patency and freedom from TLR and freedom from uh, total vascular uh, re revascularization, total vessel revascularization, again, very high at nearly 90%. These stent fractures, again, all of these were core lab analyzed. So it's not like people like me saying, oh, this is what I thought the stent looked like. The, the data and images were sent off independently to a core lab, randomized to who would perform the procedure and so on. And there was considerable improvement as expected in both DCSS and the Civic 20. So we would expect to have uh, data out to three, year, three years, I think is sometime just before Christmas uh, in 2020. And, and I would expect we'll see the same uh, features that it carried through. So briefly, I'm just gonna show one case because we don't have uh, all, all day, but I think it's important to get a flavor for this. Um, we've already talked about, and most of you are very familiar with how we do this, but by and large, I, I'm moving more and more to the neck for my chronic cases. So I go from the internal jugular vein. I know that a lot of people have, have great experience puncturing the femoral vein and the thigh. I suppose one of the big learning points is avoid the common femoral vein if you can, because often, particularly in post-thrombotic cases, the, uh, the disease goes down to extend to the common femoral vein. And then obviously having crossed the lesion and confirmed where you are, you need balloons of adequate size, pre-dilatation and post-dilatation are essential. Occasionally you'll need a snare if you're crossing a particularly difficult lesion. Um, patients with May Turner, we've already talked about a similar case earlier today, and land your stent precisely is important, and I think intravascular ultrasound helps, but is not essential in this. Um, Post-thrombotic syndromes are, are definitely the, the, the more difficult animals because your inflow is so critical. And I've learned, obviously, from Tony uh, Agasparis and, and Mark Meissner and, and a wide variety of the experts that landing your stent in, in appropriate position relative to the profunda and the femoris and identifying what is the dominant inflow are, are essential steps. There's no point in extending your stent into the femoral vein, for instance, if the femoral vein is very scarred and the ma majority of the flow is through the profunda femoris, because then the, the flow has got to go through the interstices of the stent and obviously is more likely to result in long-term problems. So we use lots of different angulations. Um, and I think that identifying the inflow for me is one of the key aspects. Um, large balloon dilatation. Uh, this tends to be very safe in post-thrombotic cases. Um, we would tend to go to the stent diameter. Uh, some people go a couple of millimeters above. Uh, I certainly would not go anything below the size of the stent that you're going to put in. Ibis certainly has uh, place uh, advantages. Uh, it confirms your landing zones, confirms your stent expansion. It concern, confirms the extent of disease pre and post. So that's really important. Um, and ideally, with the modern laser cut night nozzles, and particularly, I suppose, the Bard Benova for me, um, the, the triwheel or the triaxial technique, it's incredibly precise so that you can land the stent clearly into the inferior vena cava, but clearly not touching the contralateral wall. And I think that's very important. Um, so, again, same sort of case as before, 74-year-old uh, lady, big swollen uh, leg, positive DVT, uh, CTPA and CTV shows as follows. Um, you can see that we've got thrombus just poking into the inferior vena cava here. Um, and the artery or the aorta is just about to split and it's clearly compressing here. There is no May Turner, or there, sorry, there is no left common iliac vein at this point here. And then thrombus, if you look carefully enough, often goes into the branches of the internal iliac. And that's how the patient presents. Because if you think about it, blood flow has not been traveling up this left common iliac vein for years. It's been traveling through the internal iliac. Um, I presume you're still seeing my screen. I certainly hope. Um, we, see, we see four CT scans. Uh, Thank you very much, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, so um, you can appreciate we've got a very swollen thrombose vein and afterwards we, we figured out there was actually a lesion in the endometrium here, but that took us a bit of time to get there. So this particular case, as it was an acute DVT, prone, popliteal, 10 French sheath, 5,000 heparin. Again, we went for a single session thrombectomy. I think on this occasion we used angiojet. This is our initial imaging and um, you can appreciate that we have got a, an occlusion here with well-developed de collaterals is ex extending down into the labia and across the pelvis in a standard manner. 
and the lesion was crossed quite easily. Pre-dilatation, as I've stated, is essential, and these would be the balloon sizes that I would use. I would probably go with 16 down to about the level of the pelvic brim mm -hmm. and 14 below that, and I'm quite happy to take 14 into the femoral vein. Uh, Jerry. Yes, sir. I mean, maybe it's just me, but yes, all, I, all I see is still the slide with the four slices of the CT. If, if others too. have seen something different, can they say that? Maybe it's my... Steve, no, I have the same thing as Paul. Yeah, I may have opened up a new window on top of that. Try pressing your escape key and going back to the original. Okay, escape key, right, okay, right. So there you go. There you go. Okay, now we're back to where we were, so the videos won't play, but look, it's still better than where it was. Good Lord. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so you're not going to see the balloon inflate here, but we, it shows the lesion quite nicely. Uh, at least I'll try and click it again, but nothing's going to happen because that's already happened before. Um, and luckily, you don't get to see me deploying the stent here, but it does open up quite nicely. Um, and it's a very precise stent implantation, I must say, with this. Post-dilatation uh, stent placement is essential. Uh, when I see people place a stent and not dilate afterwards, I find that difficult to understand. You get a really good chance at that time to open the stent up to its fullest extent uh, initially um, and so, so I would strongly believe in post -dil dilating to the same diameter as that which you had achieved or used previously up to high pressure um, and your completion angio um, shows <laughs> rapid flow no kidding I know it's okay uh, I don't really want to learn more there but anyway uh, rapid inline flow and you can appreciate that uh, we've got a uh, good stent uh, and I probably went slightly too far because it's almost touching the far wall there. Um, With the yeah. flared end on the, uh, the Novo stent, how do you uh, gauge uh, the sizing for a cava that may be on the smaller side as maybe you have here? That's a fair point uh, because Although it, it seemed that the, the uh, disease of the thromus didn't involve, or there's a small area of thromus here, but you're absolutely right. Uh, it hasn't been an issue for me, I must say. I haven't had patients have undue pain. Um, I think the first few times you place, uh, uh, whether it's a um, uh, Bard Vanova or another self-expanding laser cut night and all, you probably, at least for me, I revert back to my wall stent persona where I tend to land it too high. And as you get more experience, then you come down lower and lower until you're sure you're, you're, you're covering um, the, the common iliac artery as it crosses, but not uh, covering the, um, the, preferably the contralateral vein, whereas clearly I have got it partly covered here. Um, so the flaring hasn't been an issue for me at all, I must say. Um, I, I'm certainly open to correction on that. I don't believe that one uses the same size criteria that you do for wall stand. Uh, so that I know a lot of workers are using, say, 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter wall stents in, the, in, say, common iliac lesions and then ballooning them up to 16. That's not the way I use a barred Venovo. I use a 16 millimeter stent, balloon it to 16 pre and post, and we seem to achieve favorable results in that manner. Uh, has anybody else had problems with the flared ends, or is, it just, or is that just a, an impression of yours, Paul? I don't know that it's a, a problem. I, I have to say, when I when I am extending a stent into the cava, I use IVIS to measure the size of the cava. And I don't like to have the stent okay. at the same size or bigger than the cava because I think if you're a little high, you may compromise the flow from the other leg. And, yes. I, and I know that there was a learning curve for me to think that a, a, a 10 or 12, uh, excuse me, a, uh, a 16 millimeter of an oboe actually flares out to 18 and you have to take that into your mental calculation. Okay, and that's a fair point. That's a fair point. And I suppose really you've, that's, you've illustrated that quite nicely here because I probably have gone to the far side even though I looked as if I was, you know, I thought I had landed it quite properly there. It hasn't been an issue, I must say, uh, in terms of pain, I suppose, which tends to be, I, I know that when I was using wall stent mentality to place uh, the Novo stents. If, if you start off using 20s and 18s, you do get a lot of back pain. Um, so I've, I'm downsizing now to 16s and 14s, and I think that Stephen Black is something along those lines as well. Uh, yeah, no, Steve, Stephen could talk, speak for himself, Jerry, but this is yeah, Stephen. Uh, Steve Elias. Yeah. I, think, I think all of us are, <laughs> are realizing that, uh, that you really need to size just about one-to-one -one with, uh, with the newer stents as opposed to a, a wall stent. And, and also, 
you probably you don't need to be into the cava all that much as long as you're maybe a, a five millimeters, a, you know, above the area of uh, the arterial compression. So you can just, kind of, I just kind of go about five millimeters into the uh, IVC at this point with the, with the Renovo stent uh, because of the properties. Um, so I think we're all getting down to that. It's, I, it's going to be rare. We're going to see 20, 20 or 18 size uh, Renovo uh, stents or the newest stents being placed. Can we uh, wrap up? Yeah, Steve? you, you, you can see that, uh, Steve and Jerry, from, from all the all the data, the ID data, those stents are not used. We just have to unlearn what we did with Wolf Stent with the new Nice and Stents. It's not the same yeah. thing. And yeah. that's, uh, that's the point. Yeah. Okay, Jerry, keep going. Um, and pretty much uh, th that's that's all I've got to say, really. Uh, anticoagulation afterwards is fairly important, uh, obviously. Um, I think I do, one thing I would say is I get the hematologists involved an awful lot. And I learned this really from, from Stephen Black, amongst others, because it is a team game, you know, it's very difficult um, to manage all aspects of it. And I think that the hematologist, certainly in our hospital, and I know from, from Steve's experience, adds a great deal to your overall management. Um, little tips and tricks in terms of uh, uh, anticoagulation specifically. I know that, for instance, we're, we're using a lot more low molecular weight heparin in the first two weeks now, and then transitioning to NOACs. Um, there's there's a few pieces in that um if, if you're not sure about the the patient if you're not sure that they're going to be really good at taking their anticoagulation you may be better off sticking with warfarin so that at least you can when you see them back in the clinic you might be able to get an idea as to whether they're really taking their warfarin because you can assess their inr whereas you can't as readily do that with your noac um we use compression therapy as much as possible despite the SOX trial and i use knee high class twos um, and again, your scanning protocol depends how you do it. We, I do it day one on everybody and at four weeks and at CT at, at eight weeks, again, a lot of cancer center, a lot of cancer patients. And so um, they, they tend to get their CT scans for, for free as it were. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jerry. And we wanna thank Bard also for uh, supporting us. Uh, we're gonna move along to our next uh, segment, which is on pelvic venous uh, obstruction and d disease. Uh, we have with us Kush Desai, who will then share his screen. Okay, and um, as our panelists, we have Paul Gagne and Manj Goel and uh, Ellen Dilla, who is back on. So Kush, take it away. Thanks, Steve. Jerry, great presentation. Uh it's good to hear from you. I'm going to present a case and uh, I'll probably be a little bit brief just so that we can try and get back on time um, on chronic venous obstruction. Uh, so this is a 65-year-old female with left lower extremity DVT after obstetrical procedure back in 1995. She developed left lower extremity edema, daily pain with activities. She's never had a venous stasis ulcer, but her primary symptoms have been venous claudication, significant varicosities in the left leg, and what she's noticed more recently is that her right leg is getting more swollen, even though she's never had a DVT on that side. And we'll talk about why that's the case in, in a moment. Um, she's also having some more superficial venous disease symptoms uh, on the right, uh, although all the duplex ultrasounds on the right have been negative. She's been uh, compliant her pretty much for the last 20, 30, 20 years with uh, compression therapy. She wears thigh high um, grade two stockings and wears it daily uh, without fail. Um, and uh, her venous clinical severity score of her left leg is 15. So obviously she, she has very uh, significant symptoms. Uh, and she's compliant with her Coumadin and has been on Coumadin for several years. So uh, briefly, uh, I can ask the panel, um, well, how would you proceed with imaging in this patient? Paul, what would you consider? So I haven't seen a duplex yet. Is that correct? Uh, we, no, we haven't seen a duplex yet. This is a patient that's coming in for the first time. Yeah, so I, I would start with a, a venous duplex uh, of the leg uh, above and below the inguinal ligament on the left, and okay. uh, probably on the and look at the iliacs on the on the common femoral on the right. Okay, Manj, would you consider doing any cross-sectional imaging, or would stick with duplex? So, if she's going to be a candidate for potential stenting, if the symptoms are bad enough, then yes, you'd also get some cross-sectional imaging. But again, our guys are, are getting very used to looking at the iliacs on duplex, so we'd have a good idea on duplex. 
So duplex shows chronic uh, common femoral and femoral vein occlusion on the left. The right side is normal. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, our, uh, and as, uh, as Jerry has mentioned and others have mentioned as well, including Bill Marston, that um, our iliac duplex is not uh, always the best. So we are somewhat in the practice of obtaining cross-sectional imaging, uh, in this case, a CT venogram. And what you see here is that there was likely a left iliac vein compression, as you can see on the image here. And as we scroll down, the left iliac vein is imperceptible, calcified in some regions, and then as right here, and then once we exit the pelvis, the common femoral vein is calcified, expanded, although not present, so it's likely expansion with just chronic material, and you see this large collateral across the pubis here. And this is the reason why, I've seen this in several patients, I've written a paper on it that's in CBIR, that we have this almost autologous saphenous, saphenous bypass, and these patients develop contralateral swelling because the right leg is literally drink taking entire volume of the left leg or whatever leg is occluded uh, in the in the iliac segment. So, so Kush, is there reflux down the good leg? I mean, uh, I, can, I can see the I can see the cross pelvic lateral flow, but what's the mechanism for the increased swelling if there's no reflux down the right leg? You know, that's a good question. I don't recall um, if we did a full reflux exam. If we did a duplex examination. This was last year, so I don't know if there's reflux. My, my sense is that there probably is, but it's also a volume phenomenon. There's a large amount of volume that's going into that leg, much more than those veins are supposed to. And if you look back at the CT, and you look at her right iliac vein here, I mean, her right iliac vein is roughly the size of her cava. Yeah. So clearly, think there's just not enough room for all the flow to go through two legs, and so the stuff on the right has to kind of back up. Is that the exactly. mechanism? Yeah, that, that's what I think. Yeah. So um, the CT shows a post-thrombotic occlusion of the left external through common iliac veins. Um, we see that saphenous, uh, saphenous collateral that's causing uh, that I think is causing her mild right leg symptom symptoms that. If we can get across and open this up, we should improve our red leg symptoms. So how would you approach this case? Um, positioning, supine, prone, obviously the common femoral vein is involved. Um, what do you gentlemen think? So, so our, our practice is pretty much always supine. I, I hate, I mean, general anesthesia, I think is pretty essential for these cases. It's you know, very sore to balloon these veins. So, and I really dislike putting patients prone in the general anesthesia. We've got a couple of uh, nerve problems with patients being turned. So I think supine, mid-thigh, femoral vein access would be what we would do. Mid-thigh, okay. Paul? Uh, I favor a popliteal vein access uh, okay. for a host of reasons. And if the patient is able to do it, then we do it. But there are certain patients that just physically can't do it for obesity, back problems, or a host of different issues. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my, my preferred. And Paul, you know, given that you have a a really busy and robust office-based practice. Is this somebody you would do in the office or would you bring them to the hospital for this? So, no, I, I think um, as we've done more and more of these cases, if the patient is a good candidate uh, for the OBL, so, the, so that's going to be somebody who we, is not obese, somebody who can be comfortable in the uh, prone position, somebody who doesn't have a, a significant COPD or, or, or other problems, then, then we've been uh, comfortable doing these uh, in the OBL when you've got disease that's limited between the common femoral and the, the superior portion of the common iliac. Once it goes into the caver or once we're going bilateral, then those go patients we do at the hospital. Okay. Um, Jose, can I, can, I, can, I, can I just ask one quick question? So sure. I still have colleagues occasionally who say that there's an enormous cross pelvic collateral and therefore that's already bypassing the occluded vein. And, uh, I think most of us would agree that just isn't valid, but I mean, what are your thoughts on that sort of logic? If you, you know, we still have the occasional uh, non-specialist colleague who still believes that that collateral should be enough. I suspect that that line of thinking is based on arterial disease, where an arterial collateral may support, for example, wound healing. Um, they may have claudication, but it may support, get a toe, pr a toe threshold up above the, the healing uh, threshold. But Steve has, said, Steve has said this a number of times, um, a venous collateral is never normal. It's never normal. And if it's there, for example, at the end of your procedure, um, if it's slowing down, that's a good sign. If it's filling and draining at the same rate, you haven't done enough. And so you need to kind of figure out where to go. Um, but I think the other, the other part you kind of mentioned, 
is, is that it depends on the clinical scenario. I mean, even on the arterial side, uh, you have collaterals that, that don't lead, you have patients who have occlusive disease and collaterals who are able to heal a wound, who don't have rest pain, who don't have the advanced form of the disease. Right. And it's the same thing on the venous side. If you had an occlusion and a collateral and an asymptomatic leg, we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's right. Uh, yeah, but that's in right. the setting of, of symptoms, clearly the collaterals aren't adequate. No, the right. collaterals are never adequate. And even, even when we were doing palma procedures, and I've done my share, meaning across pelvic bypass, even under the best of circumstances, they did not work all that well to help help the patient out. And you're using a normal saphenous vein for those procedures. Jose, did you have something to say? Sorry, I was screwing around with this login. If you could give me a one <laughs> sentence recap on the oh, case. Sure. 65 year old female with uh, long standing, uh, 20 years ago, had a, a DVT of her left leg and has had post thrombotic syndrome since. Uh, never has had an ulcer. Primary symptom is uh, edema and venous claudication. And her cross-sectional imaging and her, her, her non-invasive imaging shows a chronic iliofemoral obstruction with this large collateral across the pubis. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, uh, if, if we're talking about collaterals, we, we all know the, the conductance data in Poiseuille's equation, uh, the you know, fourth of the radius. So it's going to take, uh, you know, 16 four millimeter collaterals to try and uh, recap a 16 millimeter iliac vein. So. Uh, even though you you know we used to ligate the vena cava and you don't lose your legs because of collateral flow, it's not going to reduce your venous hypertension. And I think the palm off procedures are the classic case. Uh, you know, a, a four, six, eight millimeter saphenous vein crossover is not going to reproduce the venous drainage of a sixteen millimeter iliac vein. Yeah, uh, good point. So uh, moving along, how do we think, um, how do I think, uh, how would we approach anticoagulation in this patient? Would we continue our Coumadin? Would we bridge to something else with heparin? Uh, do we have a target ACT or do we not measure ACTs? Maybe one or two comments on this. Yeah, Jose, do you measure ACTs? And, and so th th this is during the procedure, I assume you're gonna put early extent, this is uh, perioperative anticoagulation? During procedure and then interprocedural. Inter yeah, I, I I tend to uh, you know I I found that five thousand was not enough. I tend to bolus almost everyone with ten thousand, and uh, and don't really even follow ACTs even the, in the elderly. And those are people that have come in on Eliquis. I don't stop the Eliquis. I don't even stop the morning dose. I bring them all in fully anticoagulated if they're on it. I bolus them with heparin. And uh, you know, carefully do the procedure, and, and uh, just seem to not have uh, you know intraoperative bleeding because they're, they're scarred veins. Uh, even if the, if the wire is poking in and out of the vein a hundred times, as, as we've all seen, postoperatively, I've really gone to this uh, not so, in these types of patients that that were worried about inflow or that were beating up the iliac vein with, with aggressive balloon angioplasty, and there's a lot of inflammation. Uh, I've gone to this uh, three to four weeks of anoxaparin to cover all the factors, especially factor 11, uh, and then go over to uh, to the DOAC. And my favorite is Eliquis because of the VID dose. Yeah, a lot of great points. I mean, I continue my patients on anticoagulation. I supplement with intraprocedurally with uh, heparin if, as long as there's no hit history. If there's a hit history, I use bivalirudin. I like low molecular weight heparin in the short term and then uh, transitioning to a DOAC such as Eliquis. And yeah. I, I too don't just, measure ACT. Just, just a quick comment on Jose's point there. Uh, if you do use ACT, I think what you find is that the old habit was 5,000 units of heparin was a standard thing that we gave in vascular surgery. As soon as you start using ACT, you realize that's false. If you right. want decent anticoagulation, you've got to go higher than that. And it doesn't yeah. matter what the weight of the patient is. So eight to 10,000 is the place to start for anticoagulation and procedure uh, to Jose's point. Uh, I do measure ACT and, and that's the, one, the biggest lesson I learned from measuring it was I needed more than I thought. Yeah, and the last point I'll make on this is that in the US, our heparin is so variable um, from practice to practice. Um, the heparin that you get in the UK and in Europe is probably better quality. Um, I have noticed very high doses of heparin and ACTs haven't budged. So, um, Steve's point is well taken. Um, so in this patient, I did prone positioning. I did posterior tibial vein access, not at the calf or not at the, the not at the ankle, up high at the calf. I put a ten French sheet that accommodates it just fine. Um, the patient is fully heparinized and kept on Coumadin through the procedure. And this is what the initial venogram looks like. You can see that the femoral vein is occluded. There's this 
axial collateral to the profunda that connects up here to the occluded uh, common femoral vein, uh, multiple other collaterals as well. And then you see this, which is an interesting finding that I've paid attention to more and more, and that's the GSV. And in this case, the GSV ended up being um, very helpful. And we'll skip this question for the panel because I think we've talked about crossing catheters and uh, wire choices uh, quite a bit over the last day or so. Um, but in this case, I couldn't identify the common femoral vein. I mean, it's here, but what is exactly the right channel? And you're looking at a three-dimensional representation or three-dimensional structure. So in this case, I actually punctured the uh, the great saphenous vein in the low thigh and put a five French catheter in there. And then in the right obliquity, I get my two catheters as close as possible. And that's gonna be your common femoral vein, at least to, to some reasonable degree of certainty. And so that's what we did here. This is a Triforce crossing set that we put in. This is um, often what I use, and it's a very useful tool to cross these occlusions. And you find the nubbin of the common femoral vein right here. Um, and we got up high and you can see the- Kush, just one comment. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of folks like popliteal vein access, uh, you know, prone. And an acute DVT, I, I can see, you know, why. But in a, in a chronic, you, you're really at a disadvantage not being supine. You, you kind of lose the neck. Uh, you lose the mid-thigh. You lose the posterior tibial. I mean, you, you can access all three of these, you know, supine. So, you, you know, if we're, if we're worried about seeing more, you can access a posterior tibial vein and get a good lower extremity venogram. Of course, a six French sheath in the posterior tibial vein, you're not going to put a big wall stent in the iliac from there. So you get to do a second puncture site up higher, usually in the femoral vein below the confluence, you can manage a confluence. And in some of these where you can't see the common iliac vein, you need to come down from the neck, come down the cava and start, you know, and even the contralateral uh, femoral vein. So it's not uncommon that I'll have a stick in the neck, both uh, thighs and in the tibial vein for some of these cases. So it's just a comment that I think you really limit yourself prone with popliteal vein access. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, heard, I've heard that this is the way I've been doing these cases. I, I, I'm able to find the common femoral vein. Um, if I think I need the, the IJ vein, typically my patients are in, under uh, general anesthesia. I'll puncture the EJ before they're prone and I have access to the neck. I just did a cable reconstruction this way. Um, and they're, you know, they're prone views, so their face is, uh, is down and you have access to the supraclavicular fossa quite easily. Um, one of the things that I like with this is that if you need to access the common femoral vein from a pop access and you can't cross the femoral vein itself, you can actually get a catheter into the profunda collateral and find the common femoral vein from that way. So there's a couple different options, but I, I, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, uh, I think. Um, and this is just the way I've been doing it for a while. But, but I do think that the Jose's points are, are well taken. But here you said you accessed the posterior tibial vein. I did. Yeah, so the patient was supine. No, it's prone. I did, posterior, I'm sorry. I did a posterior tibial right at... Um, All right, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did a posterior tibial vein with this patient prone. So then when we crossed here, we can see what we, we can see the iliac vein and you see the string sign right here and that's your iliac vein and what you need to target your, your crossing catheter with. And then once we, once we cross that, um, what do we do? And um, the, the question I have is how do you use IVUS in a post thrombotic occlusion? What information, Jose, what would you use IVUS for? How does it help you? Um, it is a helpful tool, but I think we need to spell it out clearly. Yeah, for me, it's, it's almost all technical, you know, Number one, if, if we're doing these difficult recans, I want to confirm that I'm in the lumen. Mm -hmm. um, then vein sizing, uh, you know, stent landing zones, proximal and distal, uh, completion, you know, uh, post dilatation, completion, stenting, and measurements. Uh, but, but it's all numbers like that. I, I think I heard in the last session that it uh, checking for blood flow with an IVUS catheter can be misleading because sometimes it looks like smoke inside of the stent right. uh, that looks like thrombus and it's slow flow. But I think it's purely for sizing and, and positional, knowing where my wire is, you know, confirmation. Uh, you, we've all seen these cases where stents in the freaking vertebral column or some crazy right. place because people didn't do confirmation. So, right, right. Um, I think it's really, Kush, I think it's really important, as you know, uh, 
it's, it's making sure, for example, where the uh, deep femoral veins are coming in. Sometimes they're multiple so that you have good inflow to your stent uh, that, you know, you're extending probably into the common femoral here. And then, you know, you want to, if you have some segments of the vein that are more normal in caliber and quality, may help you with stent sizing. Although in this case, I think uh, that's not going to be so helpful. And then I think uh, uh, what we just heard is that after you treat this patient and you stent it, you want to make sure that stent has opened yeah. up to get good caliber. And, and I, it also helps you with, particularly with these new nitinol stents, um, it helps you measure the length that you need because it's a marking catheter and you can know exactly where your confluence is and pick one stent instead of having multiple stents. So here's the ibis on this patient and you can see the compression site here and then the obliterated lumen. And it, it's not so much for diagnosis uh, here, but it, you, can, you can mark exactly where your confluence is, so up here. And then under fluoro, you can stop and say, all right, I'm going to center there and I know exactly what length of stent I need to cover the iliac segment, which is what we did. So we confirmed the, the chronic nature, which we knew, of course, and then we confirmed exactly what length of stent we would need. So we pre-dilate so that we can actually deliver the larger balloon dilation catheters. And I know Jose and many others have said this, that pre-dilation to the rated stent diameter is an absolutely critical concept. Otherwise, your stent will not expand to begin with and you won't even be able to post-dilate to the rated diameter. So that's a, that's a very important concept. We did an 8150 balloon, and then I pre-dilated down uh, to, to I, I placed a 14160 in this patient. Um, so we placed a 14160 in the left iliac vein, covers the entire common and external iliac lesion. And then we need, to, we need to think about what we're gonna do with the common femoral vein. So this is what it looks like. And once we we post-dilated this, we obviously have to address this common femoral vein. And in Jerry's talk, uh, the last talk that we heard, it's important to not leave just the joint here. You want to extend this above here so that you don't have a mechanical failure at the inguinal ligament. So what we did is we placed a 12 uh, Kush, step. Sorry, go ahead. Kush, actually, that point you just made is, is really important. And I think... Um, uh, and I don't mean to be critical, but uh, that area where you've got the stent, just at the femoral head, the vast majority of stent fractures and stent compression that we've right. seen in the literature have been at the femoral head. And right. any time you have an overlap within a centimeter of the femoral head, you're introducing mechanical problems that can, can later be an issue. So I, I, would, I would say the more I've learned, that distal end of the stent you can see in your left picture should be about two or three centimeters higher so the okay. whole transition no. point is in the external iliac vein well away from the ligament no. uh, and that, that's uh, that's really crucial with the, the Vici stent um, it's probably less crucial with the open cell stents but you do start to see stent compression at the ligament in the open cell stents with overlap at that area so that's an interesting point and I have seen stent distractions here I haven't seen fractures here I've seen fractures here right at the groin crease the physiologic fulcrum of the hip um, I have seen stent distractions and I, I think you've actually shown me fractures here too so it's a, it's a point well taken yeah yeah, it, so, the, 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 yeah, let me. The analysis of Vici stent fractures, uh, the majority at the femoral head, and where I've seen the problems with Bob and uh, uh, Jeff with Abra, actually, that's the only one I haven't seen a fracture with yet, but it's sort of been at the Bod and uh, the um, uh, uh, sinus venous stent fractures have all occurred around the femoral head in the cases of, that I've reviewed, the, the vast majority, 97%. So the next question, if you have a nitinol stent, as you do, and you need to go down to the femoral vein confluence, do you do it with a wall stent, which don't fracture, or do you do it with nitinol? Because we've all seen the fracture seem to be a nitinol, and no one's really reporting fractures in wall stents. So you do, it, you do a hybrid procedure with two different stents? The problem with the, with no, the I, wall I'm stent happy, at I'm this level. I'm happy with open cell nitinol. Open cell nitinol is absolutely fine at that level. It's just about choosing where your transition is. So longer stents... Are, are more fracture resistant. If you bend a short stent on the bench, a 60 mil stent, it's going to buckle. A longer stent has a much more natural bend to it. So what you really want is 120, 150 going from the confluence to in the external iliac vein and your overlap zone moves right up and you minimize the number of overlaps that you have. So a single overlap with two stents is fine. So uh, I think the open cell nitinol stents, I'm not, I'm not worried about. But you, you, crossing with a wall stent would be totally reasonable. Yeah. Would you consider taken... building from the bottom up in this situation? Say again. 
stenting first here and then up here? Yeah, yeah. Starting at the common femoral and building it up. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Mahmoud has talked about that and uh, several people have talked about that, but I'm not aware of any data or convincing evidence that suggests you have to do it that way. I think it's totally reasonable, um, but it's probably operator preference. But I think it's actually more reasonable uh, with, with these stents in that we know the exact length of where they, what they're gonna be as opposed right. to a wall stent. So here, you know exactly where you wanna be and it's gonna land exactly where you want to be. So. Going from the bottom up, I rarely do that, but that's one of the advantages of, the, of these stents. You know exactly where they're going to wind up. Right. The key is just planning, are you, right, guys? I mean, it's just like aortic procedures. You want to know where your stent's going to start and where you're going to end up so that you can avoid the uh, femoral head area. So, exactly. Right. All right, so, Kush, we got to move along, which you said sure. when you first started, but we always, get, we always get caught up with this, but that's okay. So, this is the IVUS, and you can see that. Here's the compression site, so it landed where I wanted it to, and we would bring it down, and we have nice apposition all the way down below the ligament, and we can see Profunda entering right there. So I was happy with the result. Uh, good flow on the final venogram, which you saw. Um, and we, we did for, we'll skip these questions for the plant panel because we were running short on time. I continued her on Coumadin since she had been on Coumadin for several years. I didn't want to switch her to Lovenox and introduce any sort of issues there. Um, if patients have been on Coumadin, I don't, I don't, uh, and have demonstrated that they have stable INRs, I'm, I'm not going to rock that boat. I started her on Plavix, which of course we know that there's very little data for antiplatelets in venous disease, but um, we're, we're doing that. I don't do dual antiplates, I do a single. Uh, for three months, and then I transitioned to baby aspirin. Her swelling improved and pain entirely resolved at one week, and she was able to play tennis for the first time in 20 plus years, which is, of course, a gratifying outcome for a patient like this. And then she came back at six months. Um, she's, meds are fine. Clinical improvement remains. No worsening of symptoms. Her right lower extremity symptoms, which she had those mild, that mild swelling, has completely resolved. The abdominal wall collaterals are gone. She's had a seven-point reduction of her VCSS, and this is her duplex, and as you can see, uh, the stent is widely patent out at six months. She's actually was due for her one-year follow-up during COVID. Uh, it's been pushed off till July, so I'll report back once I see her. Um, but that's very good. Nice go ahead, Jerry. You have a question? No, I, I, I'm just saying we're going to we're going to move along. But that really brought up almost all the points about uh, stenting for chronic disease that uh, that people might have. So that was great. So uh, I'll change gears a little bit and move out of the iliac veins, and still we'll talk about acute thrombosis. This is a 62-year-old female with facial and right upper extremity swelling and pain, history of colon cancer and chemotherapy. She had a right subclavian port. She has a history of left subclavian DVT. She presented with bacteremia in right upper extremity DVT. That was the site of the port. The port was removed. She was given antibiotics and eloquence and discharged, only to come back with worsening symptoms. She got readmitted a week later. And now she has uh, developed on the typical picture, we don't see that frequently, of the uh, superior vena cava syndrome. You know, she has a painful right upper extremity, painful right breast. She has difficulty breathing. Her face is swollen. She doesn't recognize herself from the mirror. A couple months ago, she was totally different. Um, the duplex indicated the, the right IJ uh, thrombus, 
the right subclavian also being thrombosed. The left IJ can hardly be seen. And uh, this is the CT scan. You can see the right IJ being dilated, indicating full of thrombus that this is an, uh, an acute event. The left IJ, again, is probably scarred, chronic DVT. And as you move uh, uh, lower on the CT scan, you can see the, uh, the innominate and eventually the superior vena cava that gets smaller and it has an acute on chronic kind of component. So uh, the question would be, please play question number three out of the questions that I provided. What would you consider doing in this patient with a acute uh, on chronic superior vena cava uh, syndrome? Yeah. Uh, Mike, you have the other one? The, yeah, here we are. Yeah, a, B, C, or D. So here we go. You all can vote. Marcus, I apologize that I missed the first part. Did, does this lady have a uh, AV fistula anywhere? It does not. Okay, thank you. It does not. And, and Marcus, again, is there any evidence of a PE? No evidence of PE. And it's here right side that is mainly painful. The right breast I showed you in the picture and the right upper extremity. Okay, Marcus, you see the results here. So people are suggesting aspiration, thrombectomy, and standing. That is, that is, that is interesting. Um, yeah, very also. So how would you do no, the aspiration thrombectomy? What advice would you recommend for aspiration thrombectomy? Is also a, 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 there is also a chronic component involved here. She had a, she had a, a port there for, for several months. Yeah, I'm surprised. Maybe they were influenced by the commercial before the uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's an advertisement. So, um, so, so wait, let, let's, let's just quickly ask the panel here. Jose, how might you? Well, yeah, I'll chime in on that. Uh, it, we don't do many SVC uh, thromboses, but we we get them. And uh, so I, I've gone to this, um, you know, indigo, uh, even an acute on chronic. Uh, I think it helps to bulk the lumen. Uh, and you know, I can't wait for the for the twelve French to come out with with the more right. powerful but suction because you transit going through a, a chronically scarred. Uh, yeah. I, I would try and re canalize the entire segment first with a wire and then catch it on pullback. And, uh, you know, that it's the only device that I've seen where you get some of the, uh, the, the well-organized thrombus off the wall. Uh, yeah. Andrew jet, you do not, uh, you know, just maceration with a balloon, you do not. Uh, so no, I, I think no. it does a better job debulking uh, acute and even be acute on chronic. You know, Jose, I, I, the clot retriever, I don't know anybody else, but, but the clot retriever I've had some with some of the chronic stuff as well. It kind of tends to core it out a little bit. I don't know if anyone else has that experience. He does. I've seen that as well, Steve Elias. This is Paul. I've had some good success getting out some kind of that, that uh, more subacute and chronic stuff yeah. with clot retriever. Yeah. Now, in this case, the clot river will not apply. You cannot advance the, the collection bag as far high. Uh, the, the indigo might work if you could advance it through the scarred segment. So what'd you do? So I accessed the right basilic vein and I accessed the right common femoral vein. My plan would be to try to recanalize at least one internal jugular vein and that would be the right internal jugular vein and the right subclavian vein. Uh, I had to cross with a Triforce cook sheath down to the uh, SVC and coming from the groin, I tried to pass my wire up to the right IJ. Uh, this is the Triforce coming down to the SVC and, and here, here is what I see the first uh, venogram I obtained. I have difficulties advancing the wire up to the IJ because this is my ultimate target. 
So I had to access now through the IJ going down to the SVC, which I subsequently snared up to the IJ. And now I have my glide cath from the groin up to the distal right internal jugular vein. So I have a wire axis now. Nice. My balloon macerated, and here is where I am right now, with clot sitting inside the chronically scarred veins. And now is the question, what do you do? You could use the indigo. So if you do use the indigo, um, you want to use a buddy wire to get the indigo up, right? Because right. you, you don't want to lose your wire access. So I would leave those wires that you have and send up another wire just for the indigo and then take the wire out when I do the aspiration. Would anybody just stand without doing anything? No. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, it's a pretty mobile area. The, the stents are going to be, uh, it's a challenge for stents to hold up over time. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so people recommend thrombolysis. And actually, this is what I did. I decided to use the angiojet, acknowledging that using the angiojet uh, very close to the heart is, is uh, risky for, for bradycardia. And actually, we had bradycardia throughout the whole session of the angiojet. So we had to use it for five seconds. As soon as we saw bradycardia, we stopped and started all over. And again and again, we did it. We did like three, four passes, uh, five second intervals. And uh, post angiojet, this is what we got. Did you pulse it first uh, and leave this sit for yeah. 30 minutes and then throw yeah. it back to me with the yeah. angiojet? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So not that much better, but a little better. Yeah. At this point, I assume whatever is left is chronic. Yeah, did you, did you balloon again or no? I see you put a stent in, okay. So yes, uh, that would be my <laughs> Did you ibis it? You can see the me. Did you ibis at all to see? Uh, I, I didn't, I mean, it was it's clear. a great place for ibis, I mean, to answer that question, how much uh, chronic thrombus is on the wall? Well, I wasn't planning on doing anything else other than eventually standing. And I knew kind of my, my landing zone. Of course, I would get more information if I use the eyeball. You're right. But I kind of knew what I was planning on doing. It wouldn't really change my final plan that would be to stand from uh, health. If, health. If, do you think that's a, a May, not a May, a, um, a first rib compression on the uh, proximal subclavian or the central subclavian? You know, uh, that's what it looks like. And I'm thinking that's, uh, Ivis would have told you that. And, and that's a uh, high pressure lesion on that stent. You're actually right. I didn't think of that at that point because I had the profound etiology that was the port that was sitting there for several months. And I yeah. assumed it was related to, to the port. So how uncomfortable did you feel about placing these stents? Well, I was nervous because this is not something we do that frequently. This is maybe the, the second or third time I'm, I'm doing this, but I was treating like a, a really bad condition in this patient. She could hardly breathe and her symptoms were really severe. So I didn't feel I could make her much worse to what she already was. Right. Anybody uh, else on the panel would have put a stent in the uh, supply well, one? Uh, I mean, I've used a lot of VT stents, uh, as you probably all know, and I would be extremely nervous about, well, in fact, I haven't put any in the upper limb. Yeah. Because I, I think the, the, the structure for that bend and angulation in the arm, um, you know, uh, with the first rib still there, I think uh, you've got to watch this like a hawk. Yeah, um, yeah. So one other question. So she didn't have an SVC syndrome as far as the head, correct? Because she had left-sided internal vein, uh, internal jugular vein drainage. Is that correct? The left side, the left IJ was chronically occluded. And she didn't have a big head. It was just right-sided symptoms is what I heard. She did have. The head was huge. No, no. Okay, she did. Okay. She needed that take care. So that, this is how she was. And this is how Three months later. See, your head is now your head is bigger than hers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. In that case, I don't believe you. That's not the same patient. I can't be the same patient. Right. It is the same right. patient. Okay. You know, Marky, one, 
one thing to consider for, for long term, you know, we've done some uh, cl medial clavicular resections to decompress the uh, thoracic outlet uh, in patients who aren't going to do well with the first rib, mostly in our dialysis patients. We haven't done a lot of them, but we've done a few. And yeah. to the point of compression, it's something to think about. So yeah. is this something that somebody would entertain now at this point? This is a patient who has colon yeah. cancer also. Yeah, I mean, you've got to take a view on her life expectancy, Matt. So you've got a stunning clinical result there. That looks, it's amazing, the two different yeah. pictures. Um, I, I, I think if somebody's got a very short life expectancy, then fine, I wouldn't worry. But if you've got somebody who's, who's got a long duration to go, <clears throat> I would be very worried about that stent at the rib. And you could you could right. do something about that now to relieve relieve pressure on it. Because if it fractures and you get compression, then your bailout option is extremely difficult. How, yeah. How far out is she, Mikey? Three months. All right. I mean, you can image her with provocative maneuvers and see if there's any uh, right. impact right. on the stent itself. Yeah. So I don't know if you if we have time to go over another case or we can no. just we do not. Those are great cases. But that was a fantastic case. Yeah, great. My name is Steve Hahn. I'm from Kirkland, Washington. I'm in the commercial flooring business. We sell, clean, and install commercial floors. Uh, we've got a, a wife of 26 and a half years and three daughters that are 21, 19, and 16. I um, like to golf, uh, travel quite a bit. Um, I coach boys basketball. The thing that bothered me the most about my leg was that if I wore shorts, people were like, dude, what is wrong with you? Because uh, my, my right leg was nasty looking. At a certain point, I was just tired of, of dealing with that. So I went to a varicose vein doctor and she brought up heaviness in legs. There was swelling. They itched constantly. I started taking a cart, a driving, a, a golf cart, because my legs just couldn't, couldn't take walking 18 holes. And that was part of my exercise, was to walk 18 holes of golf. So that was a very impactful. I didn't know how much time it would take to get these dealt with. I had insurance questions, that type of thing. So I finally, when I started my own business, one of the first things I wanted to do was get my legs dealt with. So after the doctor mentioned the venous seal procedure and talking about how there's going to be minimal pain that you're going to be able to get right back to work, I was interested. And so I literally, I got in my car as soon as I was done and I went right to work. The, the way that I best describe what my leg is like now is I show people pictures. Now they don't understand that the leg heaviness is gone, that I can walk 18 holes of golf. When I show them what my leg looked like before and what it looks like now, they understand. First, we're going to have industry session, and then, um, and then we'll have Tom. So let's have uh, Mark and um, Nick Morrissey on the on the panel. So this is uh, brought to you by uh, Tactile Medical, and uh, with us uh, for Tactile uh, is uh, uh, Nick Morrissey, who's uh, known him for many years over at the Columbia University. He's a vascular surgeon and also uh, Mark Mellon, who's a vascular surgeon, as well as a um, wound specialist. We just have a couple of questions uh, to ask them about the, uh, the tactile products that they've been uh, using. So uh, Nick, um, how commonly do you see uh, these types of patients uh, presenting with leg swelling in your vein practice? You, know, you have a busy practice at Columbia in New York City. Yeah, um, Steve. Um... We did. We actually worked together for a while, and you know what the practice is like there. I think that um, we see a lot of patients referred for swelling of the lower extremity, and I have a pretty diverse practice with a lot of arterial work, aneurysm work, fistula work, but I still think that on average in a given week, I'll see six or seven new patients with leg swelling. Uh, you know, what's been interesting is that the COVID uh, lockdown has produced an interesting phenomenon of 
there's a decrease in mobility of all patients. Uh, I had someone come in yesterday worried about a DVT who I've been treating for a while. Uh, and she had a significant increase in her swelling. And I think we related it back to the fact that she hasn't been able to do the walks that she normally does. And combine that with the fact that we've been shut down for quite some time, uh, we're, see, we're gonna start to see an onslaught of patients uh, with, the, with swelling. And we see them live, and we've also done a fair amount of telehealth with these patients as well. Yeah, yeah, so I know I agree with you. The, the swelling aspect has, uh, has increased uh, significantly due to you're just a, to immobility. Um, let me ask, uh, Mark, has that been your experience as well in terms of what you're seeing wound patients as well? I am. I'm, uh, we're very busy in our wound practice and telehealth. It's amazing because we just can't get the good exams we need to with telehealth. And I think to begin with baseline in my 20 plus career, I, I recognize now I vastly underdiagnosed interstitial edema, chronic edema, lymphedema, lipedema, lympholipedema. And from a wound care standpoint, it has a dramatic impact on wound healing rates as well as recidivism rates. And, and I think you bring up a good point. You've been practiced for 20 plus years or whatever, but it does certainly seem more recently, we are all aware in the uh, medical community regarding lymphedema as well as, uh, as phlebolymphedema and how, how the venous side of things and the lymphatic side uh, interact in ways that we always thought they were two uh, separate systems. So Nick, can you give us a little idea over time how the practice has perhaps changed a little bit in managing these people with lymphedema or phlebolymphedema, what, what you've done in the past and what kind of techniques and technologies you're using now and specifically, you know, regarding the tactile products? Well, I think you um, sort of alluded to it and it, it really comes out of our evolution of understanding of what's happening. And in my mind, I've sort of taken a different approach in terms of what the leg looks like on the inside, as opposed to just static compression, which I think gives you a certain amount of prevention of further leakage. You're not addressing the, the fibrosis, the inflammatory changes, and all of the things on the inside that make that leg, that make that tissue not normal, which remains if you just rely on static compression. So I've taken a more aggressive approach uh, to active drainage of the extremity. I will say that my level of frustration and my patient's level of frustration in terms of the treatment options has gone down dramatically since I've been able to use you know, the tactile uh, FlexiTouch system because you know the first thing that they'll notice is an improvement in how they feel. Uh, not so much how it looks right away, that takes some time, but they definitely notice a change in how they feel. Uh, and there's no question that there's a decrease in their complication rate and an increase in their satisfaction. So, so when, when do you start to consider, you know, instituting the, say the, the flexi touches as uh, you, you said, is it somebody, is it someone comes in with, you know, yeah, they've got some early lymphedema and, or do you wait until it's advanced and then you say, oh, now we need to use it. Yeah. I don't wait till it's far advanced. I try to wait them out in terms of, getting a sense of their level of uh, compliance and commitment to actually seeing it through, because no matter what we do, they need to be um, committed to long-term uh, chronic care of their condition. So once I get the sense that they are not completely asymptomatic with just static compression and, uh, and activity, then I have a low threshold to try to introduce this because I feel like the sooner we do, the less, um, chronic changes take place on the microscopic level, which lead to immune compromise and higher rates of ulceration and cellulitis and hospitalization. So I gauge their commitment and I gauge their enthusiasm. And, and most of the time I've been uh, very successful by doing this. And I try to institute it before it gets too complicated. Yeah, so Mark, let's uh, ask, can you, can you help listen to the people who are uh, listening here? Uh, what is the commitment? What kind of commitment does the patient need to do? And and then what have been your experience with the commitment that the tactile company itself has uh, to these patients uh, when, when they did ordering the flexi touch? Well, Nick brings up a really excellent point. We've got to get the patient's uh, mind engaged. And, you know, Tom O'Donnell and a medical student published a JVS article within the past two years that talked about one of the biggest risk factors for not healing is the patient's depression. And I, I think unless you're between the ears engaged, and that's one of the first things I think we have to start with is patient engagement, education, understanding, that takes a really uh, significant team. 
And so as we build that team, it's certified lymphedema therapist. Uh, we've got to teach them MLD. We've got to teach them complete decongestive physiotherapy. So many of our patients have sarcopenia. So we've got to work on muscle mass building, which contributes directly to lymphatic flow in the lower extremities. If you have no muscle mass, and if your lungs don't work well and your chest doesn't work well, you're not going to be able to have good, ultimately receptive decompression and really uh, like a straw, remove that fluid out of the legs and get the lymphangions uh, maximal. So it's really a, an important team approach. And, and also our physical medicine rehabilitation physicians, you know, we want to engage them because they've got a long history in helping us to teach us. And our local PM and our doctors have been really significant. So I think it really takes a huge team approach to get this done. And uh, once we get the patients engaged, educated, committed daily, they see rapid accelerated changes that's a self-fulfilling um, uh, aspect that I think uh, patients quickly within six to 12 weeks will see significant changes, uh, especially with a flexile, with a tactile FlexiTouch Plus where we're getting really significant receptive decompression and max, uh, maximizing utilization of lymphangion function, which clears the lymphatics. And I think they see a really significant improvement as part of an overall program. And of course, we've still got to use all the standards of care, such as uh, good compression wear, exercise, et cetera. Yeah, no, no. And, and I think you bring up the point. It's while, while tactile has products that take care of it, it is a team approach and um, it's all got to be coordinated to get the best out of the patient. You can't just say, here, just put this uh, Flexi touch on and everything's going to be just fine, um, but it's it certainly adds to it. Nick, talk to me uh, a little bit about what length of time. What do you say to the patients? You know, you're gonna you're gonna prescribe this for you. Uh, someone's gonna come to your home uh, from tactile, make sure everything's working out all right. When do you tell them to come back for you to evaluate them, the effect of what uh, what you've done, and um, what do you say should be their commitment? Is it lifelong? Is it six months is it a year um i usually see them three to four weeks after they have the device delivered i um have a pretty good system with my folks in the city about you know getting the patients evaluated quickly and the patients are usually contacted within the day of um, of me making the referral i do mm -hmm. tell them that in general it's a lifelong commitment in one way uh, or another because i consider it to be a chronic lifelong uh, disease so they, but I, but um, as was mentioned, you know, when they start to see some improvement, they're much more willing to hang in there and go the distance. You know, I think that in my previous uh, iteration before I started using these uh, devices, you lose a lot of these patients because you gave them compression and they were unsatisfied and they would, you know, not come back and not feel like there was any option for them. So I continue to see them on a regular basis and, uh, it's usually the first one is three or four weeks after they've tried the device. And I, I also will call them uh, the first week or so after they start using it to make sure that they're tolerating it well and doing it the right way. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think these people are looking, they're looking for help. They've been pushed around many times and, and no one's gotten the, them for the right type of therapy. So Mark, just to, to kind of finish up here, what, what makes you choose, say, the, the tactile FlexiTouch device versus another device? And why have you moved really to, to using this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think we have to look at differentiators and part of it is simply peer reviewed published data. Um, if you look at the data that in the um, uh, dollars put into research, uh, tactiles excelled above everybody else. And then when we start comparing pump to pump, uh, most of the other pumps are a higher pressure hold and squeeze, which does more channeling, which really has been uh, even published in journals where biopsies have been done to show that they're pushing fluid through extra vascular non-lymphatic channels. So if we're, if we're outside of the lymph lymphangion, we're not accessing the endothelial glycocalyx. And if we're not ac accessing the endothelial glycocalyx, we're not getting nitric oxide production, maximizing immune function. So I think channeling versus non-channeling, and we know with tactile because it's more MLD-like, it's more of a gentle manipulation. First, we're doing receptive decompression with the 12 minutes up in the waist, and then the legs kick in just like a therapist would do, and that's been validated over uh, many decades. So it's replicating um, what an MLD can do. We know the outcomes, 
And then uh, the third point is just what we're seeing with clinical outcomes. We're dealing with many wounds that are 200, 300 centimeters squared, venous hypertensive, flebal lymphedema. Steve Dean just published a paper that showed this is the most uh, common thing that's coming into Ohio State University. And um, we're seeing in, impressive outcomes uh, in coordinate this with as a total package of care. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great summary of, of the device, the product, how it works, and, and some of the successes that you and Nick have both mm. had. So we want to thank Tactile Medical for um, helping us and uh, with the uh, course here. And it, once again, without their support and all industry support, we would not be here. So thank you very much. We move on to Tom Maldonado, who is going to talk about swollen legs. Right, Tom? That's right. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. And share your screen. Uh, can you see me okay? You see my screen? We see the screen. Okay, great. So um, I don't know if I can just advance this. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk too much about um, sort of the workup or even the intervention um, from procedure, procedure wise for, for treatment of swelling. We're just going to talk and try to focus on compression. And I thought what I'd do before going into some case examples is to talk uh, in general. Um, most of us obviously are very familiar with this, but just to review some of the different forms of compression so that we can all sort of uh, speak the same language here. The, the elastic or what uh, is often referred to as long stretch bandages um, you can see here sort of expand and contract to accommodate uh, leg geometry during walking. This is your basic um, compression hose. Um, and, and they basically, this, this pressure changes uh, over the calf, they're very small. They're not very high pressure changes. And you can see that you have the ACE bandage, you have the um, compression sock there, um, and is, is, can have continued sustained pressure even with the patient at rest. That becomes a little bit relevant when we talk about immobile patients patients who are, um, have fixed ankles for whatever reason, uh, bedridden patients. Um, high compression, um, inelastic or short stretch bandages, all sort of uh, synonymous. And these in fact cannot accommodate changes in limb circumference. So they really have their most um, important effect when the patients are up walking and using their calf pump. It sort of supports or, or um, acts upon the calf muscle pump um, uh, uh, to, to elevate the pressure in the leg and return the venous, uh, the venous flow. So what that means, the converse, of course, is that the low, it has very low resting pressures. So in patients who, as I mentioned earlier, are immobile, um, for whatever reason, handy, uh, bedridden, for instance, these are not going to be very effective. Um, what I always consider sort of a paradox, or, or ironically, in patients who have arterial insufficiency, and we'll talk a little bit about this, just touch upon people who, the role of getting um, arterial Dopplers and assessing ABIs, this may in fact be safer because it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, impair arterial flow as much as maybe a more elastic uh, high pressure uh, sock. Um, I think the other thing to, to point out is that these um, inelastic short stretch bandages have most of their effect on the deep venous system as opposed to the elastic or long stretch, which is uh, acting most on the superficial system. Um, I think it wouldn't be uh, complete without touching on the disadvantages of this, these inelastic uh, bandages. They require more frequent replacement because in fact, as the edema sort of resolves, they lose or it follows the edema and you have a reduction in the, in the pressure there. They're also somewhat user dependent. There's really an art in how you apply some of these um, inelastic short stretch uh, bandages, especially the multi-layer bandages. And if done incorrectly, it can cause all sorts of problems with slippage and wrinkling. And, and, and I think that uh, is something to, to note. Um, you can see the circade is, is uh, one such, I think, more user-friendly uh, inelastic uh, short stretch uh, device you see here. And it's something I'm fond of for, for reasons we'll talk about in some of my case examples. The multi-layer bandage I touched upon, there's two to four layer pro form, um, pro four bandages or, or others, the Uniboot, um, and these, in theory, have sort of a, a hybrid advantage of all the different, both inelastic and elastic. But I think it's important to know that it's the concept of multiple layers that can sort of accumulate the pressure. And so that's really, I think, where you gain the advantages of the multi-layer bandage. Here are some examples of the Nunaboot, mostly for chronic venous ulcers, um, is, is what we see here. And the Pro 4, again, this is just multiple layers. Um, you can see that you sort of have some, um, you know, give in the elastic there on the most outermost layer that you want to have. Pneumatic compression, I think um, we just heard about uh, uh, tactile and the flexi touch, which I agree 100% with the prior speakers about the uh, evidence-based um, 
sort of robust data that Tactile has put forth. And I think that in my uh, practice is also a reason why I really do use this quite a bit. Um, um, the, it's a concept that dates back, as you see, quite some time. The FlexiTouch, uh, we talked about um, having a number of advantages over the basic pump. And you can see here the sort of um, uh, MLD uh, simulation, which I think is a nice way of describing it, as opposed to the press and hold action of the higher pressure pumps shown on the right, the basic pumps. Um, what's unfortunate sort of as an aside is you oftentimes have to get sort of a trial of a failure with a basic pump before getting approved by insurance companies for the uh, FlexiTouch. And it's, it's unfortunate because I think sometimes those basic pumps um, can do more harm than good. Um, I want to just mention since the title of this talk is sort of algorithmic, how do you approach swelling and compression for swelling? I think this is a nice sort of review of what we do when we have swelling in the presence of an ulcer. And you can see here, uh, I don't know if my pointer uh, works here, but you see that, of course, once you identify a venous ulcer in the setting of swelling, um, we want to quickly also assess arterial insufficiency um, and really try to determine whether it's a very severe arterial insufficiency or more moderate or mild insufficiency that may play a role in what kind of compression we choose. Um, assuming there's not really severe arterial insufficiency, I think we can then make a decision on the type of compression, whether we're going to want to use sort of uh, uh, elastic or inelastic. And as I mentioned earlier, when we have an immobile fixed ankle in a patient, we generally are not gonna drive the benefit of the inelastic um, uh, bandage. And we wanna go maybe with a more elastic um, uh, long stretch uh, bandage. Um, so without sort of further ado here, I think uh, also in the interest of time, maybe we can talk about a couple of patients and Steve, feel free to cut me off. I've got, I don't know how many, but um, we'll start with patient number one. Here. Do it. So uh, this is a 38-year-old man um, and very typical patient that we see with uh, complaints, oftentimes more cosmetic than, every, than anything, as that sort of promotional video showed the guy playing golf. But in fact, they do have a lot of these symptoms of swelling and aching. And when you really probe, you find that they, they are, in fact, symptomatic. Um, um, you can see the duplex. Again, no pictures, Nikos, but you see there's a reflux in the AGSV and the SSV. The deep system is competent. So... Um, Again, not to talk about intervention here, whether we're going to close or not close or do adjunctive phlebectomies, but as far as compression, um, you know, this is an, a pretty basic example of where elastic compression um, uh, plays a role. I guess the only question is to whether the, what people's sort of opinion is about the, the, the degree of compression and also the knee high, thigh high, um, you know, I don't know how much discussion there is for that, but this is uh, this is a very typical patient. I thought I'd start okay, so out let's, with. Let's just quickly let's talk about Ignacio and Lowell. Unmute yourself, yourselves. Um, so okay. Ignacio, yes. Tell me when you need compression above the knee. What patient might need, or does any patient need compression going above the knee? No, I think the, not all the patients will need this kind of uh, compression of the knee, especially I use uh, it in patients that has uh, varicocytes like we are seeing above the knee. They, they feel better with uh, this kind of uh, compression. And for those patients that only have a great second of vein reflux, I think below the knee compression will, be, or will work better than the, if we use uh, above the knee. But, I think this is a very good case for for you say it uh, above the knee. So, Lo, what are your thoughts about it, that? So, I think the nice to see you, Tom. By the way, hi, Lo. Uh, nice to see you as well. I think I think that that it's really dealer's choice here. I think it really depends on the patient and the compliance. I can tell them what to do, but they may not do it. And majority of patients prefer below knee, twenty to thirty, uh, as opposed to thirty to forty. And I'm talking about the average varicose veins. For those patients that have had an ablation, there are some reports to say that the pain scores go down with uh, above knee, but I'm not a big fan of it. No, no, I'm, I wasn't talking about post-ablation or post phlebectomy. Uh, Obviously, you're going to put some compression over the area, but I, what I do is, in general, I almost always start with below the knee, no matter where the varicosities are, because um, that's how the calf muscle pump works, and you want to support it. If they feel fine, below the knee, then great. If they say I still have aching above, then I'll say try above the knee. But, but in general, I, I start from below the knee. Tom, I don't know, what do you do in general? Yeah, no, I, I agree. The only thing I would add is that um, as far as the, the patient's compliance with, stock, with stockings, um, of course, the, 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 
that speaks to the pressure and the gradient and, and also whether it's an above the knee above the, or, or below the knee because if they're not going to be compliant they're not going to don the sock then it really does not make much sense so I, I always ask them very frankly patients are you going to use this stocking i mean this looks like a fairly healthy athletic man but in some of the older patients some people have arthritis they're not able to really pull the sock on i think that's where there's some discussion as to what kind of compression you recommend all right good let's go another next case so this is a 73-year-old diabetic um, man um, who's on diuretics for many years. Um, you can see he presents with worsening swelling for the past uh, couple of years, especially at the end of the day. Easy bruising, itching, cramping, all the sequela uh, of, of venous hypertension. There's no DVT on the duplex. There's some incompetent tributaries and there's pulse style flow in the deep system. You can see when I go ahead and do, uh, you can see the pitting edema. I'm not sure you can make it out here, but there's a pretty impressive sort of dimple there. Um, has had some easy bruising, no real venous, healed venous ulcers, but a lot of sort of classic venous hypertension um, changes here. Um, you know, I bring this case up really because this is sort of what I would call this sort of, um, he has other, other reasons to have edema, maybe he has some cardiac uh, right heart uh, strain or failure, but, but he um, but clearly has venous changes. And I think this is where you start to enter the, the area of flebo lymphedema, and there's sort of a mixed picture here. So um, this is not the cosmetic concern for this patient, um, but I think, it, again, elastic socks in, the, in a patient like this who's quite mobile is, is what, I, uh, what I often recommend. So what are, you, what are you going to recommend for these people? I'm sorry. Yeah, el very, same, same idea. Elastic compression socks. I think that um, in, in someone like this who has very distal swelling, uh, knee high, uh, oftentimes 20, 30 millimeters of mercury uh, um, compression, um, the circade sock is again in the older patients who have difficulty donning the elastic socks sometimes does make some sense i find they're more compliant um they're so, easier so to explain about the circade of the velcro products for people who may not know about it so i may have glossed over it there's one nice picture showing that um it's essentially not an elastic it's more of an inelastic um model of of compression um but in addition to some of the advantages of the inelastic um, compression, maybe for, for ulcerations and, and deep venous problems, it also is very easy to don. It doesn't require um, uh, that sort of, um, you know, it, it can be put on with Velcro straps um, and can, can uh, and I think patients can have a higher compliance with that. So people always ask, when should you get concerned that they have diabetes? Or when should you get concerned with their arterial system and their flow? Lowell, what, what makes your decisions on things? So basically, I, I want to know from the patient how I can make them feel better. That's number one. Number two, if they have uh, diabetes or an arterial component, I want to make sure that, that their vascular insufficiency, arterial insufficiency is not significant. And there, there, there are questions about what the ABI index should be before putting on compression. So I, I think if you took a, a panel uh, there would be a whole lot of uh, different answers. But for me, anything below 0.6, I start to get a little antsy about putting on compression. So it really depends on the patient and how I can make them feel better. And again, uh, Tom mentioned some really good points. Some of these older uh, or some of the geriatric patients or mobile patients cannot put on compression. And that's when the, the Velcro type compression is superior. Yeah. Ignacio, any other thoughts regarding well, I think that I think that uh, if you have any concerns about the arterial system in the patient um, that could be uh, the only con contraindication for using that kind of socks uh, compression elastic compression devices um, I think that once you have the AVIs uh, above 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 you can use it normal compression of these kind of patients. Yeah, I think people are going a little bit lower now. Like Lowell said, we're, we used to be a little more concerned. So for those of you out there, if you, if you do prescribe it to someone with a 0 0.7, 0 0.6, you know, be aware, ask them to, to notice how their leg feels. But um, it's, it's a, we are kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, well, now, Tom, and the other thing I'll say is that it depends a little bit. I mean, this patient has no wounds, but in a patient who has an active wound, although it may look and, and, and smell like a venous ulcer, there's oftentimes these mixed etiologies for these wounds. And I oftentimes um, will, will be aggressive about treating some of the underlying arterial occlusive disease uh, concomitantly if there's yeah. a wound. Yeah, definitely with the wound. Go, next case. 
So um, go to this bit. Uh, go, go to the next one. <laughs> this page you're not too happy with. I mean, this is a quick. These are very quick cases. This okay. is this is just a, a 42 year old, very classic uh, lymphedema patient who's had. I just point this out because you know the the cellulitis and the wound complications. I think in 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 lymphedema is really something that deserves mentioning. I also brought and I like this picture because you see this patient had had some sort of multi layer compression or at least feeble attempts at that. You see on the right, it's slipping down. They, have, they are really challenged by um, dressing changes and by, by compression, these patients. And so I think that the pneumatic compression, the flexi touch is a real, real godsend for them because uh, it, it can help them uh, pretty dramatically. You see this patient's not doing so well with the uniboot on the right. Yep. Uh, and so it's, uh, we're going we're gonna to give you, Tony says we're going to give you one more case. All right. Last, uh, yeah, let's, yes. uh, let's Whatever talk you about think this. Is, is the case. This well, uh, there's 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 no the case, but this let's make this number the last one. It's a, a it's a very classic venous stasis ulcer in both uh, extremities. There's some incompetent perforators that have been that have been uh, treated, and I just bring this up to show again, um, you know, the, the very classic venous, um, you know, uh, hyperpigmentation and and the ulcerations here. Um, and this is a patient who I I see like we all do in my clinic quite frequently, and and we're. We're putting a uh, uniboot, um, um, you know, non-elastic compression on, and and um, you know it's interesting with the COVID because they they have a challenge a little bit with the visiting nurses that have to routinely come to the house and help them with this. They can't can't go to the wound care centers. Um, the only uh, advantage of being at home in COVID is there's captive audiences that keep the legs up, and sometimes I find that helps them more than anything um, by be, by uh, you know keeping their legs elevated. Yeah. But this is a you know an uniboot um, compression uh, patient. Okay, any other tricks for these ulcer patients with compression? Anybody? Aside from, I, I do like the Unis boot as, as well to get them under control. Um, we usually place them and the first one or two times we see them, we have them come back, not weekly, but maybe two to three days later and, and reassess because you, you know they may lose some, uh, some of the fluid and you have to reapply with a, a, a slightly firmer uh, compression. So uh, Tom, I mean, while it's a, not the sexiest of uh, topics, I think uh, we all see p patients like this all the time. The great majority of the time, not everybody needs an operation. And these people are coming to us because they're going nowhere else. The, the vein and, and lymphatic specialists are, are the ones who take care of it. So I wanna thank you for giving us the options and what we can do about these people. And you need to keep all this stuff in mind because these are, these are people that really quality of life is a, is a big thing. So uh, thank you, thank the panelists. Lowell, you stay on because we have, those of you who have hung out till the end, we have uh, a big treat now. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for giving us this opportunity to share a little bit about Juzo with you. Um, as most of you know, Juzo uh, is an international manufacturer and distributor of quality compression garments, and we've been knitting for over 100 years. So um, I've heard a lot of talk today about, you know, the differences between elastic and inelastic modalities when you're treating your patients. And um, one thing that you can count on is that we do a lot of things at Juzo to make sure that our products are really focused on helping a patient stay compliant. Um, we uh, really go above and beyond to make sure that our products are offering lots and lots of choices um, in terms of, you know, styles and aesthetics. And we also do a lot of extra measures to make sure the products are as easy for folks to get on as possible. And when you think about inelastic, our compression wraps are um, really unique because they're reversible. This will um, help a patient uh, have choices aesthetically, but more importantly, it will help the product have a longer uh, um, lasting um, because since it is reversible, you can, you know, use either side. So you're going to get a little bit more life out of the product. So um, thanks again for giving Juzo the opportunity to uh, share our information with you and to be involved in this. Okay, Caroline from Juzo, thank you very much. And we thank Juzo for support. For those of you who are still listening, this is our last industry advert, as Mike says, so thank you very much. And now you're all in for a treat. You've been waiting for Neil Kulnani, who has worked very hard to make this an extremely interactive and fun session. So Neil, unmute yourself. 
share the screen. Jose, if you can come back on, if you're around still, we'd like you here. Tony's here and Lowell's here and Nico's here. Uh, Neil, take it away. Great, thanks, Steve. I'm assuming you can hear me. Yep, we can. Good. Yeah, thanks to you guys for the invitation. And uh, I, I've got the cleanup role here. I've got the last session of uh, a pretty outstanding meeting. So I had some challenges with that in the context of trying to keep everybody's attention. So I, I thought I'd try something a little different, um, borrowing from uh, middle school teaching, uh, trying to use some sort of visual aid to kind of keep everybody's attention. So I'm going to try to frame this talk after the pardon the uh, interruption ESPN uh, conversations that go on, which I always find kind of engaging. Um, and so I have my 20 minutes and I have my topics you see on the right with some weird thing at the bottom. And we'll go through each of these. And I just, as I pointed out, this is uh, a strategy that educators use to reach difficult to, um, to reach adolescent males. And I figured our audience with the exception of Caroline and perhaps some of our colleagues that I know and don't know uh, who are uh, not uh, male on the on the talk, uh, I, I uh, take I sort of would like to apologize to them. <laughs> and Jerry, Jerry, I, I think this was particularly addressing you and what you have uh, planned for this <laughs> afternoon to try to keep you engaged as well. I heard you. <laughs> Thank so, you very much, Neil. <laughs> so these are quick shots. So these are going to be three minute cases, and we're going to just talk about. Um, uh, basically very shortly, and then I'm going to get the panel engaged and we're going to put up a question right away. So let's get started. Um, a 52 year old man, uh, otherwise healthy. Sure. This is what his ultrasound looks like. What's in red is reflux. Sure. So this Neil, is Neil, Neil. Yeah. your screen, Neil. We need, we, you need to share your screen. Oh, I thought I'd been sharing the whole time. We've been watching you. Well, okay. <laughs> you look good. That must have been fun. It, we, we Sorry about that, guys. We would, we, screen. You don't even want to know what the text messages were happening. <laughs> <laughs> Share your screen. There we go. All right. So this is the this is the template that we're going to be using. Perfect. And these are the topics. And we have 20 minutes. And now I actually have 18 minutes. So oh, I better uh, go faster. Uh, so this is our first case, a 52-year-old male um, uh, with uh, left lower extremity varicose veins that are symptomatic, and he wants to take care of it. This is a summary of his ultrasound. Uh, great saphenous vein reflux in red down to the upper calf, and then big varicose veins, eight to 10 millimeter varicose veins. Um, what also complicates this case is that his great saphenous vein is big diameter, 20 millimeters at the top, 12 and 10 millimeters down here. Um, and so the topic is large diameter great saphenous vein and large tributary veins. I'm kind of putting a couple things together, and uh, the clock is not working. That's interesting. It worked very well just before. Jerry, are you sabotaging me? So you don't feel alone. Um, so perhaps, perhaps I'm, glad we'll I'm not the only donkey. <laughs> <laughs> so All right, Neil, just go ahead. Oh, yeah, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, oh. I'm fine. My, my, uh, my, uh, I'll, uh, we'll just keep going. So, um, can I get the first question, which is, how would you address this? And while I'm not going to read the responses out, everybody can look at it. But perhaps I can get the panel engaged in telling us how they would take care of this. So um, Jose, why don't you, since you're, since you're on, uh, nice to talk to you. Now remember, uh, this, you is, this is a takeoff on pardon the interruption. So it's short, quick answers as well. Sure, there's always a lot of concern with these big saphenfemoral junctions and thrombus extension, but I feel very comfortable using a thermal ablation to mess with anesthesia to really squeeze that thing down and burn it with extra energy. I, I tend to prefer laser because I can really dial up the energy, uh, you know, old, uh, super dose. If you're gonna use RF, you can have to, you know, three or four cycles on the SFJ, but I do prefer laser. And then I like ambulatory phlebectomy for big varicose veins. <clears throat> so he would pick four. Um, I think I have uh, Lowell and Ignacio there. Maybe I'll yeah. go with Ignacio next and save Lowell for last. No, you, got, you got Lowell and you have uh, Tony and me and uh, Deeper. Lowell. Yeah, go yes, sir. Um, I, I, uh, I agree with, with Jose 100 percent. I do it together um, and I would not uh, stage this procedure at all because those veins are subject to uh, phlebitis. So I do it all together. All right. This was the easy case. Maybe we could see. Are you able to show the results of the polling? See if everybody and that seemed to be the most common. Um, yes. Good. OK, good. So let's move to the next case. The next case is basically the same 
the same case, except now the reflux goes all the way down to the ankle. Um, so everything, everything the same, diameter's the same, uh, except the, the reflux is to the ankle. So let's get a question here. And how would you treat this guy now? And the only thing I added to the selections uh, in addition was thermal with foam for the lowest 15 centimeters of GSV. Uh, I'll preface the conversation. Maybe I'll let, actually, I want to preface it. Steve, why don't you let us know what you think? Steve. I'm here. Steve I Elias. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would probably just go to, because uh, if, it's, if it's really huge down below the calf, as much as I love below the knee, a therm, non thermals, I would probably use a thermal to the mid calf here. And, and then, then and whatever may be left over, maybe access at the ankle, thermal to the mid calf, and then just you know, throw some foam in as I'm taking the sheath out for the lower half to third of the, of the calf. I'm not sure if that matters, that amount of venous hypertension, but I think big veins, I think you need thermal. Yeah, and his goal, his goal um, is symptom improvement. He doesn't yeah. really care about how it looks. Yeah, um, then, yeah then you, you need to go down as low. And, and mid-calf, I'd be happy with, and plus or minus foam on that, the little segment left over. And Lowell? I, I agree. And that's totally. what I know start, too. And uh, who else did you say was on there? Tony? Yeah. Anything, anything you want to add? Do you, do you think the foam is worth doing, or do you think multiple to... to so he does. Is that yeah, I like would. A reasonable. I, I mean, given the fact that it's reflexing down to the ankle and he's pretty symptomatic, um, he's relatively young. Uh, I would, I would access, you know, down by the ankle, laser, laser down to the calf, and then throw some foam in at the last part. Yeah. As a pullback through a catheter or through yeah. the sheath. If, yeah. 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 I, so that okay. Was, good. That wasn't too hard. I'd it all the way down. I wouldn't use any foam. It's going to recanalize. I just burn it from the ankle to the junction. Okay. And any comments? Any comments on on, a, on the incidence of paresthesias with that? I'll 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 point out that I usually go to the junction of the mid and distal third of the calf. I usually yeah. pause at that point with thermal. But yeah, and and I don't even think there's anything wrong with leaving that 15. I mean, that's not that. I don't think that's going to lead to recanalization necessarily. You leave 15 centimeters. That may even shrink down over time. Uh, yeah. If you if you don't like want the foam, I don't see any big deal about throwing the foam in at the end. Okay, there's going to be a high recurrence leaving that that lower segment. Yeah, the 15 centimeters, I think. I don't know. No, we're not as, we're not as so interested in recurrence. We're interested in symptoms. Yeah, and so I, I think, think that that's the important part. And I no, think we, that you can certainly current. use. Hold on a second, I was saying you certainly can use foam, but I, I don't think you even need to do that. And I've also gone down to just below the ankle. With thermal alone, the incidence uh, of paresthesias is really small, especially if you do proper tumescent. We're just nervous about litigation. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have the so a 52 year old man and a 20 year old woman are totally different, right? I wouldn't do this in a 20 year old woman. She'd be much more concerned with the paresthesia. We definitely would talk about the risk of the paresthesia. But uh, Thea Kumar and, and a couple of these studies that that you know recurrences in the in the, in the lower calf uh, great saphenous vein are common recurrent symptoms recurrent recanalization yes. recurrent varicose veins and uh, you can take the argument to uh, do it when he represents and do it later but uh, I tend to just do well, it with, yeah. with better imaging I think we see the saphenous nerve and the sural nerve better with, with mm -hmm. duplex and I and I think you can get the, uh, the anesthetic you know, around there a little better and, and try and push that nerve away. You can't always see it, but uh, you can often see it with, with the newer device. I love this conversation, but I think our bell would have already gone off. So oh, yes. case three. Let's go to the next case. Why, why is it? There we go. So the next case is a, a younger guy with a recurrent venous ulcer. He's already had his saphenous vein ablated where it's black on the picture. And he's got a paratibial uh, incompetent perforating vein that's feeding the great saphenous vein, which is, let's just say, sort of in the four and a half to five and a half millimeter diameter range and reflexes down to the ankle. So the question can come up now, um, how would you treat this vein? And parenthetically, as part of the discussion, when I asked the moderators to, or the, the panelists to speak, tell me how you would access when you, know, you use whatever approach you use to treat this guy. We're gonna assume that he's gonna get wound care and he's gonna get compression. So we're talking about managing his venous disease. And maybe we'll start um, uh, with uh, Jose again. 
Well, this guy didn't care about a paresthesia, right? So, uh, <laughs> didn't care much you know, about his ulcers either. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, I don't know what that, 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 uh, perforator looks, how big it is. Uh, my senses just looking at the leg, I, I would tend to want to burn that. So the axis is going to be a direct axis of the perforator and thermal ablation. And then, so now instead of a retrograde axis, from the knee down on the saphenous, I would access at the ankle and go up and have a dual access and, and do it all thermal. Just, I mean, that, that's a nasty looking leg and I think a paresthesia is secondary. Yeah, I, yeah. Would, I would worry about the thermal aspect. Yeah. I, I think it's a little harder to place. You, you've given several options there. Go ahead, Lowell, I'm sorry, who is that? that was it's Steve, Steve Black. I'm just wondering with Neil's several options that he's given why you have to include uh, you don't just have foam alone uh, as option five uh, and varathene is a separate one. Varathene is heinously expensive and achieves much the same thing as foam, which is a, about a tenth of the price. Yeah. So, Good well, point. You could use the word, I mean, varathene is a form of foam and then you could decide it's uh, a yeah, 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 yeah. But I think your point of foam is, is, uh, is well taken. So, so in my mind... Yeah, but I, honestly, using, using just homemade foam in a leg like this no. that has high venous hypertension, I don't know if plain old home, you know, home-based foam is going to work. Right, but the and I agree. And you need multiple multiple treatments. Right, <laughs> but but I think you need a non-thermal here uh, because I think it's harder. I know Jose, we can place tumescence through this area of ulceration and lipodermatosclerosis. It's a little tougher. Those of us here probably could deal with that, and I agree. I'm not worried much about the the nerve injury here, but if you can get with this with a non-thermal and maybe perforator ablation and the saphenous with uh, glue might take care of, uh, of all of it. Um, and that to me is something to consider with one technology or you can Steve, do laser with one technology also. Steve, I think we have to consider that ultrasound guided foam also needs to be applied underneath the ulcer bed. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you can really do this with multiple uh, visits with, with ultrasound guided foam. And I agree, agree with uh, Chris Pittman on, on that point. Neil, we're missing the point here because it is a classic patient where the ultrasound findings are out of proportion of the patient's clinical presentation. You may do the saphenous vein, do something, but the patient's much bigger problems. Maybe on obesity, center of obstruction, uh, food static disorder, as I see from here, from his food, and multiple other things. No, I right, think that's right. a very good point. These, yeah, but, these, but, these, this, this diagram doesn't match this patient. It just happened to be the photographs I had, but I think okay. um, <laughs> scaling, scaling, scaling what you just said makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but we're assuming, Neil, I mean, you're, you know, you're a super advanced vein specialist. We're assuming you're giving us the only pathology <laughs> on the venous side. You've already, you've already ruled out any proximal obstruction. You've done all that. And this is all a patient like this yeah. has. It, and he's not a bariatric surgeon, so. And you're not a bariatric surgeon, though. No. Although this guy was obese, and so I'm sure. And, he, and it looks like also he has a little bit of lymphedema, too. Yeah. Uh, at this point, he also. He has the flebo lymphedema. Yeah, you're right. Where would you guys access to do these things? Steve, you, you didn't come down on one particular technology, but where would you access to how to well, do this? I think if the, if the saphenous of the ankle is visible, I, would, I don't think you have to go retrograde here. It's not much of a... Uh, the matter of the skin lower down looks better than the skin higher up. And is there consensus on whether the perforator itself needs to be tra uh, treated, or do you think by uh, ablating the saphenous vein, you're taking away the pressure to the area of the ulcer, and that should be sufficient? I mean, the, the question is, is that perforator, is that like a new saphenofemoral junction, so to speak? Uh, mm -hmm. And you just, you know. When these legs look like this, I'd throw the whole kitchen sink yeah, at them. I agree. That's why I said I'd probably use something to take care of both. Okay, good. I'm going to move just because of time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, might, we could talk for a while on all of these. Oh, Glory, we're we got it about another five or ten minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, 53 varicose veins, um, very tortuous GSV, and I think I probably overdrew this one, um, but I wanted to make the point and. Uh, as, as is typical when you have these tortuosities, you also get dilations. And many of these dilations and, uh, uh, are associated with little areas of narrowing as you come out of them. Um, and so sometimes these are challenging. Long and winding road, I had to make a 
you know, an, uh, uh, a reference to pop culture poetry. I chose Paul McCartney, not John Dylan, sorry. Um, but nonetheless, a very tortuous vein um, and somebody who will just, just needs to get the saphenous vein ablated. How do we, how do we manage that? We have some questions. And uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Lowell. I was just trying to answer this question. Uh, oh, I oh. <laughs> well, now you get to do it in public. <laughs> I was trying to get out of that one. But no, don't even uh, look at the questions. How would you, how would you manage the diagram, uh, the anatomy of this patient? Who needs so I, I think that um, there are many options, but I am one that might consider multiple options here. Uh, I would certainly use thermal ablation. First of all, non-thermal ablation in my hands, I think 12 millimeters is probably the, the cutoff to use the standard non-thermal type stuff and probably even less, maybe even 10. So somewhere around 12, I think you're getting into that point. So I would use um, thermal uh, and foam. Okay, you sound like Paul McCartney on this one, Try, trying many different ways. Um, Jose? So I think most of you know I'm, I'm a one and done type of guy. So I think I would uh, burn the top that's straight, you know, get the uh, access of, of the upper thigh in the straight segment and burn from saphenoid junction to straight segment. And that, that tortuous saphenous vein, I, I think I'd probably just remove it with a phlebectomy. You know, look with ultrasound, grab it with a hook, and just take it all out with multiple sat incisions. It's not going to recur that way. At least that vein won't. Tony? Uh, yeah, it depends if it's superficial. Uh, invisible and palpable, I would phlebectomize and, and burn the top. Yeah, I agree. And what do we have from the crew here? We got thermal with phlebectomy. Yep, that's most And uh, yeah, I thought I thought I'd find more people interested in Verathena for this patient, but I think the size, as as was pointed out, is what dissuaded you. I put it sort of at the upper limit of what most people say. I think for me, I I I, I feel like my foam success rate on ablation of saphenous veins starts to tail off somewhere between six and eight and certainly above eight. I haven't found it very successful, so, so I've been a little so conservative there. For those that would do phlebectomy, I, I don't uh, disagree. It really depends on, on how deep this vein is. Yeah. And if, if, if it's in a fascial compartment, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with that thought. I think it's certainly acceptable. And the devil's, the devil's mm -hmm. often in the details, but I might have considered putting in three axis points here um, and putting a laser in here, doing that one, and put the laser in through here uh, to mess it and ablate that one and do the same it's, here and then phlebectomize that. Neil, if this was uh, in the saphenous canal, based on your color coding, um, it looks like it's in the saphenous canal. If it was superficial in the skin, that would phlebectomize. But otherwise, I, I mean, I think you can argue just one and done, Varathena, the whole thing. Yep. No, Verathena. It's it's just on the big the diameter size. side. That's it's the the size, the size uh, Tony. And the, and the other areas look fairly dilated. You didn't give us numbers on these dilated. Yeah, I, I agree with Tony that Verathena certainly could be used here. Yeah. And, and there's no problem if you have to repeat it. But I think that that that's certainly an option. Yeah. And as you know, I mean, twelve is it twelve the whole way, or is it just you know one segment? Right. Any just final word? Verathena is going to fail here. But just to add a comment, if it's very, very superficial, this patient may be better off having traditional surgery. I just put it out there. Yeah. I would probably, if it was very straight, burn the top and evolve the rest. But don't forget traditional surgery is a possible option. Alan, I, not having ever done traditional surgery since I was a medical student, can you pass a pin stripper through, through a very tortuous vein? Maybe the can look at the diagram on the right and let's assume yeah, they're accessing. If, if, you, if you look at the diagram, diagram you, you would easily get a pin stripper down to the mid thigh and then you'd, I would evolve the rest. And it would all really depend on how superficial it is. And my other key comment would be if you've got somebody who's either anorexic or a big muscle builder, a bit like uh, Jose, I, I, I think a lot of these people who don't have any fat at all are actually <laughs> better off having the vein removed rather than anything else. Well, I'm gonna end this case here and I'm gonna have Alan as the first discussant on the next patient. Okay. So this guy. next guy has got, uh, he's 18 years old and he's a, a very um, accomplished ballet dancer and he's a student and he dances about 30 hours a week. 
He has no symptoms, but he has veins. And I'll actually show you a photograph. This was a video consult this week. So I figured we're doing a virtual symposium. We should show some virtual patients. Um, and so um, his great saphenous vein, I'm, I'm, I'm basing this on judgment. So I'm gonna use this for argument's sake because I didn't do an ultrasound on him yet. But the great saphenous vein is in the fascial canal here. Then there's a big varicose vein that comes off. And then it joins into what I think is a superficial accessory saphenous vein, which is visible and bulging the skin, coming down, if my pointer would work, along the inside of the thigh, down to these varicose veins that fill down in the calf. Obviously, if for him, appearance is probably going to be very important to his career. Here's an ultrasound of that superficial accessory great saphenous vein, which I've marked out in dots. This vein is continuous, let's just say for argument's sake, up into the great saphenous vein. And again, make it uh, borderline diameter, varicose veins, superficial accessory refluxing, and varicose veins. And so we can put the questions up, which are for maybe too many. Oh my God, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah. Neil, one, Alan, Alan start one, the conversation here. One quick <laughs> question, Neil, to you. Is he specific about a particular vein that he doesn't like? Um, All of them. He, he, I think the thigh one bothered him more, but but I didn't ask him that. I only saw him for 20 minutes on the, on the phone two days ago. I mean, Neil, I, if he's I a ballet that, dancer, he's gonna be wearing tights, so it doesn't really matter whether he's got varicose veins because nobody can see them. All he's gotta do is get compression tights on. But Jerry, that's a very leprechaun sort of comment. <laughs> yes, Jerry. <laughs> maybe he's not, maybe he's- Really he's, harsh. Maybe Jerry, he, maybe he's concerned other times too, not just when he's dancing, you know, maybe when he's going to the beach or something. Come on now. If he's doing 30 hours a week ballet, there's no way he can go to the, to the beach. <laughs> I bet you, I bet you these show the through his tights. Side. You, could, you can see, these, these probably show through his tights. Hey, Mike, can you just uh, mute <laughs> His tights Jerry probably there, don't Jerry. have much compression. I don't know about yeah. yours. Mike, Jerry, Mike, Jerry's cut off on the rest of the conversation. Yeah, Mike, mute Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's already drinking, I think. No, no, yes, I am. Absolutely, yeah. Damn right. It's very so, late here. It's, it's 7.15, for Christ's sake. That's the reason right. I ask that question is because I've been involved in some bodybuilders, not Jose, so to speak, and I they, they're they very involved. specific about things that they want to remove. With. So they're, they're, they're very specific about the veins that they want removed. And some of those normal veins that they see are exactly what they want to see. So that's why I asked the particular question, which vein was he? And so where would you go with that? Let's assume it was the thigh. I think he- uh, I would just do phlebectomy and goodbye. Now, if you did phlebectomy of the thigh, where you would obviously start here and end here. Would you also include this? I'm going to assume he- uh, No. And then do you think there's a risk of thrombosis if you just take out those varicose veins? And if so, where would you quantify that in the saphenous vein? So I'm looking at that and I'm sure that he's got perforators as well. Either that, that would probably not allow that to thrombose. Uh, but I, I, I think if you're gonna offer this chap a, an intervention and the intrafascial or GSV is quite large and incompetent, then I think I would probably ablate that as well as doing the avulsions. But I certainly would not now I've gone away from having, having seen quite a few cases sent from other people to see me. I certainly wouldn't do endothermal ablation in the extrafascial vein. I think the extrafascial vein is much better. <laughs> Evulsed rather than actually ablated. And then, well, Alan, how I would think, you evulse it? Would you strip it traditionally or would you no, 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 make I, a I, series I, of holes? I, I do mini phlebectomy. Okay. Yeah, but I think, I think Lowell brings up a very good point that it's it yeah. really bothering him is is the thigh. Um, I, surprisingly, perhaps the lower leg may get a little bit better once you deal with what's going on above. I don't know. But if it's a thigh, I would be minimal in this guy and not uh, maximum. Yeah, I agree too. I mean, if it, I would see what, because he has absolutely no symptoms other than the way it looks. And uh, you start stripping that extra fascial or foaming anything, he may end up with more cosmetic issues than you started with. Right. Okay, next think, deal. And let's I think we had pretty good consensus there. Let's so, go to something. Just wear his tights for Christ's sake. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Are you wearing your tights, Sharon? Okay, let's go. So a 28-year-old woman, 
has these varicose veins she's bothered by. Just as easily though, she could have these varicose veins that she's bothered by uh, for this argument's sake. Um, she has a short, and I'll just arbitrarily use four centimeter long segment of SSV or anterior accessory GSV here that's refluxing and she wants to get rid of these varicose veins. How would you manage this? Whoops, sorry. How would you manage this? Maybe we can get the questions up while um, maybe we'll get Tony to start. Uh, I would just phlebectomize and ligate um, close to where it connects to the popliteal fossa or... So just make, a, make your first snick here, pull as much as you can and tie, yep. off, tie off the vein as high as you can and let it yep. go. Yep. Jose? That's it. I yep. figured you'd say the same, so that's why I went to you next. Um, Lowell? Same. Yep. Would, you, would you consider, it's four centimeters long, would you consider a little short burn of that? No. Nah. You'll, you'll be able to. You'll, you'll be could, able to. But I wouldn't. Yeah. You'll be able to ligate that thing flush with the SFJ through the proximal phlebectomy hole, just pulling yeah. it right up. Okay. Do we, do we miss Steve? No, I, mean, I do. I agree with everybody. Exactly the same. Now, what if you don't do phlebectomies? Then you send them to or if the patient person. doesn't want a phlebectomy, let's just argue. All right. Then you're going to give up some staining with the foam. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's cosmetic. It's aesthetic concerns. I mean, really, I, I, I don't, I, you know, if you really can't do phlebectomy because you don't know how, this may be the person you want to send to somebody who does know how. Hey, Steve, any role for HIFU here? Now that's, <laughs> that, that is interesting. Oh, no. <laughs> We'll have to see what, yeah, I mean, it, it might not be. It was a relatively short segment. I don't know the results, but it's, uh, well, For let's cosmetics? see. Wow. What did we, what did we oh. uh, get oh, from the group? Okay, we, good. We don't know at all. Uh, so you have pretty one, pretty one, good one, consensus one, you know? from, the pan, from the audience also. Yes. All right, good. And so let's, let's close up the session um, with and this. The with the funny, sec, uh, funny set of Greek symbols. So. You know, back in the old days before COVID, so to speak, um, you know, teaching didn't change very much from the time <laughs> of Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato. Everything was face-to-face. -face. They had their arenas. We've had our arenas. Um, but after COVID, things have changed, and these guys have definitely <laughs> led the way. <laughs> the three right. figures uh, have led the way with uh, virtual ed uh, interaction and education, certainly in the webinars we've seen before. Uh, today uh, and yesterday particularly and and when we get together again in in July. So uh, thank you very much and this great. Greek word great. is Congratulations uh, to all of you. It's a great kudos. program. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. you Neil, can you unshare your screen? Well done. Yep. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off now. So don't, okay, good. don't be thank calling you. for me. Where are you going? <laughs> my, my daughter's my daughter's got a virtual yeah. graduation and yeah, he's, already started he really, downstairs. Uh, he does. He's, he's a, graduating thank you, from Neil. college. All right, guys. Thank thank you. Be well, everybody. Yes. Great, great job. So, um, Neil, unshare. Uh, uh, Mike, could you just put up the logo or whatever? Lowell looks nice, but we want the logo. <laughs> um, I mean, Neil brings up a great point. It's not the three of us. It's everybody on, on here that did it. Our entire team, industry as well, Radcliffe Vascular for, for doing it all. And yeah, this was something that we all thought about the moment that we said we're not going to be able to have a, a real meeting. And um, it was a huge team effort. And we hope that those of you who attended thought it was worthwhile. And if you do, you can send information to either Radcliffe Vascular or any of us directly to let us know what you thought good and what you thought maybe we could improve upon. Because as we all know, this educational experience is, uh, is here to stay. So thank you, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of the weekend. And we will keep learning in whatever way we can. Thanks. Well done, guys. Well done. Great thank job. Well done. Bye. Thank you. Guys. Bye. Bye. Great program. Thanks, guys. Dave, great job. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Well thank you. Nikos. Thank you all. Thank nice you all. to see you. And Tony, congratulations too. Thanks. Bye. Well done, guys. Bye -bye. Well done. Yeah. Well done.